Uh, hello, a very good morning to everyone joining us for day two of this webinar paying tribute to Vikram Sarabhai and the site experiment. Uh, Uh, I'm so sorry about the lag again. Uh, if you're on the lookout for a particular session, be sure to follow Manipal. Please give us a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So sorry about the technical issues on our end. A very good morning to everyone joining us for day two of the webinar paying tribute to Vikram Sarabhai and the site experiment. Just like yesterday, I'd like to begin day two by setting the decorum of code of conduct for the webinar. Kindly turn off your microphone and video so that a large number of people can join in within the given bandwidth. Due to the busy schedules of the speakers, we regretfully inform you that we are disabling the chat option for this webinar. If you are on the lookout for a particular session by a speaker, be sure to follow Manipal Institute of Communications Twitter page for live updates. We look forward to your cooperation for day two and also, of course, the many illuminating sessions that our speakers will be presenting today. We know a lot of you are especially excited for this first session. To delay it no further, I will call upon Dr. Padma Rani, Coordinator Media Resource Center and Director of Manipal Institute of Communication to introduce Professor E.V. Chetnes. Good morning, 
to our guests from India and good evening to our guests from US and New Zealand. It's my honor to introduce Professor Eknath Vasan Chitnis, popularly known as E.V. Chitnis, to this virtual August gathering. Professor Chitnis was educated as a physicist with specialization in electronics and communication. After a brief teaching stint, he began his research career in 1953 at the Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. He built for the first time in the country a Kreknov counter and associated electronics for cosmic ray work. From 1956 to 1958, he conducted a cosmic ray extensive air shower experiment at Kodekanal. He was invited to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, US, and he spent three years there. And later he joined and became a member of the Physical Research Laboratory faculty. In 1961, he set up a satellite telemetry station at the Physical Research Laboratory. In 1962, when Indian National Committee for Space Research was constituted, he became its member secretary. Since 1962, he has been very closely involved in the formulation and implementation of the Indian Space Program and in particular, the establishment of the Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station and the Space Science and Technology Center, which is now part of the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, Trivandrum. And the Experimental Satellite Communication Earth Station, which is now part of the Space Application Center, Ahmedabad. One of the areas on which he spent a great deal of time was the evolution of the concept of satellite instructional television pro experiment. SITE was a leap forging in the use of satellite technology of direct broadcasting for educational and development purposes, and the success achieved is due to the end-to-end -end approach adopted. As program manager, he directed the SITE experiment, which was conducted in 1975-76, after a five-year preparation. Later, as chairman of the Software Systems Group of the Space Application Center, he devoted his time in acquiring insights into development communication through experimental television transmission to rural areas of the Kheda district. He exhibited great social commitment in respect of the Kheda communication project which was built around India's first ruler television transmitter at Pitch in the Kheda district. The experience gained under his leadership in the site Kheda context has been incorporated in the design of INSAT system. He is dedicated to the use of communication for education and development. He has demonstrated that space technology can radically change the education and literacy profile of our country. He worked on the UGC panel on mass communication and facilitated the establishment of educational media research centers, which produce programs for the countrywide classroom. He was director of the Apple application program of the Indian Space Research Organization from 1979 to 83. The inauguration of the Apple application program at the Delhi Earth Station on August 13, 1981 itself was a unique function in which the communication replaced travel. The function at which the Prime Minister dedicated the Apple spacecraft to the nation, which was arranged in a teleconferencing mode between Delhi Earth Station and Vikram Hall at Space Application Center Ahmedabad. The scientists associated with Apple program had assembled at the Vikram Hall. Via Apple transmission, they met the Prime Minister and the dedication of the at Delhi Earth Station was witnessed live by TV viewers in Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Pune, and Ahmedabad. And this is what we are doing today. We are having a virtual conference minus the Prime Minister. We are all scholars and students and researchers from different parts of the world. So thanks to the vision of people like E.B. Chitnis and scientists at the Space Application Center, that communication revolution has happened in India and the younger generation has adapted it 
as though they were and they're born with the, these applications they don't have to learn like the older generations he was director of space application center from 1981 to 85 and later on worked as advisor of sat he was selected in 2008 as the chairman of the press trust of india professor chittas was involved in various roles with the united nations on outer space and navigation system as a representative of india he contributed immensely to the report of un group on the direct broadcast satellites of outer space held in vienna in 1968 and attended conference as a member of the indian delegation he also attended the uni space 82 at vienna as a delegate from india he has membership in various committees working groups research and scientific advisory committees governing councils working groups etc professor chittas has won several awards and accolades and the pro most prominent of them is the padma bhushan in 1985 the others are a few hariyom ashram award instituted by the university grants commission even today at the age of 90 young age of 96 professor chitnis remains alert and i have had the fortune to have a conversation with him during the preparation of this seminar and every time i feel i learned a lot of things a lot of insights that he gave me in his conversations on phone for more than an hour each every time he wanted to know if today's younger generation can imagine an india without phones and with most of the modern amenities that they take for granted he recalled those days when traveling from ahmedabad to pune was also difficult uh he also talked about at the physical research laboratory at ahmedabad when he joined as a student to do his masters research uh there were no facilities uh there he was staying in a small room in the hostel and since there was no uh electricity and available at that time uh you know freely he said that they would work in the laboratory till 1 1:30 in the night and once it became cooler then they went back to their rooms to sleep and they would be back in the lab at 7:30 in the morning and i hope you know this message goes out to the younger generation that for the things that we enjoy today our older generation has struggled for it and also the kind of dedication and motivation that they had to prove themselves and still remain humble and talk about such things as a matter of fact that they did it was nothing that he talks about as exceptional he says i did those things those were the days kind of a attitude regarding communication he made a very important remark which somehow remains etched in my memory every day he said that we need to give communication a local flavor in the global space the amount of diversity india has in terms of population and as culture it's a difficult job to cater to each of these groups but while designing communication we need to keep this diversity in mind i had the privilege of talking to professor chitnis a number of times for this seminar and then finally we decided that since it's a virtual seminar we would record his interview and then play it on the day of the seminar i'm deeply grateful to mr pavan ayangar who on our request spoke to dr professor chitnis and was able to record his interview we've edited a small portion of it which is relevant to site and we are we will be presenting it to you without taking much of your valuable time now we'll play the uh, recording of the interview and we shall hear professor chitnis's 
reminiscence of sight. Welcome all of you to an interesting interview. Professor Chitnis, uh, I think the important cog in this whole story is also the workforce mm -hmm. that worked on the ground, uh, that worked in the laboratories, the scientists, the engineers, the technicians. Yeah. Um, the human resource. The human resource, exactly. Yeah. So how did you rally the human resource? Mm -hmm. uh, that's one. The other is that what do you think role IITs played in in the side story? I come from very simple background, both economic background, family background, and education also from ordinary universities. But ISRO could turn them into wonderful engineers who have brought India great name and today India is respected in the world of space as a country, one of the foremost countries and uh, our successes to the moon and the, the Mars are well known. Um, there were about 2,330 villages selected in sight. Uh, there were around 2,330 villages selected in site experiment. Uh -huh. How were those villages selected? Like in, among six states and 20 districts, I think. No, see, uh, we decided that we'll go to the most backward states of India, socio-economically, educationally, in every way. So we didn't do things in um, uh, many parts. We went to Orissa, we went to Madhya Pradesh, to Rajasthan, to uh, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. So we had a sample and of course we were in Gujarat near Anand, the famous military, that area we chose because it was very within 60 kilometers of Ahmedabad where we, our headquarters were there for site. So, we had, uh, we selected, then we went, uh, uh, collected data, uh, the school buildings because there were morning educational programs for children, and in the evening, we brought the sets out in the community viewing situation. And uh, the adults and men and women of the villages saw the programs which were relevant, especially made for them. <coughs> so we had to build studios. India was a, we didn't have much in television at that time. So we selected the equipment, we selected a line and demonstrated to the government of India that you can save time and money and create a communication revolution in the country if you go the satellite way. And 
this site experiment did that. And after site, we went to other experiment, step symphony, then um, with a symphony satellite, and uh, then we had our own Apple satellite. And so one by one, we demonstrated and convinced the government that how satellite can help. And then we built our own satellite. So, and we said we will be able to sell the satellites. That was a, a country which was not making anything at the beginning of when we became independent. Country was hardly, you know, it's a very poor country. Education was poor, manufacturing was poor, we had few textile mills only, and they were mostly in Gujarat and Mumbai. And uh, so uh, we, I remember that uh, when we became independent, we had anything in the country. And today, look at that. So this is a great country, this is a great achievement, not only in space, but in every field you see. And Indians are now more confident. Indians are in the best of the American universities. Indians are everywhere in the world. And they come back and through ISRO and other organizations, they are contributing to India's might. Um, it's said about SITE that SITE has shown that software design and hardware planning must be built around social goals. Uh, so, would love to have an elaboration on that from you. Because this is very unique. You do not see this in many experiments or even many initiatives uh, about how software and hardware should revolve around social goals. If, uh, before site, we had a experiment, you know, Pandit Nehru thought television has no place for India. It is a in, instrument for middle class entertainment. But we proved to Indira Gandhi later that through Krushi Darshan program in few villages around Delhi, how television can be used for agriculture growth. Because India was a food importing country at that time. And today, India is respected in the world of space as a country, one of the foremost countries, and uh, our successes to the moon and the, the Mars are well known. So, it is a tribute to our own people who have brought such wonderful glory to the country by their work. Isra's story is very inspiring. Given very difficult projects, time-bound projects, but given enough backing from the top, what Indians can do. It's said about SITE that SITE has shown that software design and hardware planning must be built around social goals. Uh, so, would love to have an elaboration on that from you. Because this is very unique. You do not see this in many experiments or even many initiatives uh, about how software and hardware should revolve around social goals. If, uh, Before site, we had an experiment, you know, Pandit Nehru thought television has no place for India. It is an instrument for middle class entertainment. But 
we proved to Indira Gandhi later that through Krishi Darshan program in few villages around Delhi, how television can be used for agriculture growth. Because India was a food importing country at that time. In big rice, it was, we are still, uh, we are still importing food. So, <coughs> agriculture was important. So, through Krishi Darshan program, we proved to government that television can be an asset for development. Proper. And that was envisaged a long time ago by Vikram Sarabhi and us uh, and convinced uh, Indira Gandhi. Uh -huh. You have to have a vision. Right. You have, should be able to convince the top authorities. Right. You have to get yeah. the money. Right. You have to get the technology hmm. and implement and show. Right. Si the site was a small experiment. Mm -hmm. It was a forerunner. It was meant to convince the people in the government that mm -hmm. Indira Gandhi, because the opening of site was done through her speech to the nation. Mm -hmm. So called. Uh, hey. And then she realized that she could reach people in the government that yes, a uh, satellite can. Um, after all, they also want publicity, na? Right. That they elections karaychya sa sa. That they na mukde then they accepted the te, uh, satellite television as a medium for pro, uh, uh, hey, propaganda for uh, election purposes for everything. Right. Right. So they helped us to bring in the insight. There is no story like this hmm. insight. Uh, in the world, exactly, such a large country yeah. and such a backward country technologically, hmm. producing uh, the uh, uh, miracle of uh, insect. Hmm. India was uh, one of the uh, few countries, early uh, two or three countries in the world, mm -hmm. who were using satellite television for education. Right. Lot of credit goes to the political leadership uh, who understood the uh, advantage of uh, using television so that we can cut down on time period by 30-40 years. When the Chinese invaded India in 62, only 20% of the population knew that such an event had occurred. So the rest of the country was, didn't know anything. But and that is what satellites have done. Yeah. Spreading the communication throughout India at the shortest possible time was the most important thing. Hmm. So, we had offer from USA. They were building one of the most powerful satellite. Now you call direct reception. That idea came from that satellite. And we picked it up and said, we will set up the direct reception sets in villages so that we can cover the country fast and to demonstrate that the site experiment antennas and the front end converters and the television sets television sets were first time manufactured in India in Hyderabad Electronics Corporation of India <coughs> oh, there were Many first we did during site, earth stations were built, programs were made for agriculture, for social purposes, and uh, some of the things we continued after site for 10 years or more and learned a lot about television, use of television for development. And, uh, 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 that was a great learning experience for us and we, after birth, we got a UNESCO award for social communication, for development communication uh, uh, and it was a, a great um, recognition. Uh, so where did you find it, did you also look at the teachers for, you know, because after all, 
after all the technology, no, after everything. That is what happened afterwards. We had insight, Indian National Satellite for telecommunication and television, proving that is based on our experience in sight and step and other programs for development. The government was convinced and the, we got the satellite. So now we had to make programs which are relevant because otherwise it was only for middle class entertainment kind of show some films, Hindi movies and add few other similar programs and uh, that's about all. So we said no, it, television can be used for more national purpose. And uh, but then nobody would get convinced. So we we had a Kheda program where we proved working ten years how you can make television a part of development process. Interact with agriculture exports. Interact with uh, um, um, uh, medical exports and uh, reach the villagers with ideas on uh, medical uh, things, uh, medical, uh, about agriculture, about uh, the pregnancy of women, their um, prejudices, and uh, all kinds of progress were made. And uh, this uh, uh, is an important uh, contribution of ISRO not uh, usually realize that ISRO has, even though it is a space organization, it has made tremendous cause, uh, contribution to social uh, television and showed how television can be used and satellite can be used for wider spread and uh, for social purposes, constructive purposes, and not just entertainment. Of course, entertainment mm. is important. I'm not belittling the importance of entertainment. Entertainment is required, but uh, especially in the villages, good quality entertainment is required. And a lot of culture of our countryside could be transmitted through these uh, uh, media and we ourselves become aware of many of our country's great uh, social culture um, and uh, therefore we have to uh, keep learning because we are not experts we we have to creatively think how television can be used as we progress down the development lane. So, where did this experiment find the teachers to record and beam it, the teachers? Uh, how did or who were the teachers that you beamed into the villages? Who were the teachers? The teachers that... No, no. Teachers program, you know, you have... You know, in India, numbers are so great. Our teacher's population is more than primary teachers, more than the population of children in the country, in some small country. So, now how do you train and retrain? As a teacher join at the age of 20 or so and retires at the age of 60. 40 years, will the same teacher teach? Or will he be trained? Will he be retrained? Will he be refurbished? So this itself requires a medium like television 
for teachers training. And uh, we had a great uh, um, uh, efforts were made, uh, teachers were trained, uh, special uh, uh, vocational classes, professional classes were set up by education ministry. We had a lot of collaboration. ISRO had a lot of collaboration with telecommunication ministry, education ministry, all kinds of people uh, throughout the country, yeah, both at state level as well as uh, central level. So ISRO learned a lot and lot about these processes. And uh, the, it changed the ISRO people themselves because they did not remain only technical people. Through this process, they knew the country better. India before that hadn't developed software uh, which could really, you know, be deployed on such a large scale. See, software means making television programs for the people Especially, you must know your audience. If you want to make educational programs, you must know the children. What are their needs? You must know the teachers. What are they teaching? How the, uh, the thing changes? And there must be feedback system. Suppose you make educational program. Are they really effective? You must have the feedback. So all the process of communication we learned, even though mostly we were in a scientific, educational, uh, engineering organization, we had to learn lot and lot, which has nothing to do with space. It had to do with the ground. And learn who the people are. And the result was, ISRO came to know the country at first hand. And then learned how to use technology for that purpose. So it changed the ISRO uh, completely. Hmm. And it uh, got recognition also from UNESCO and many of the uh, the in fact uh, uh, the world came to know about space application center and they used to ask us to hold conferences on subjects which were not had nothing to do with space educational subjects social science subjects and we had 100 and 50 social scientists and producers in our centers. Mm. No other space organization had people like social scientists and uh, producers and uh, television makers in the world. We had had this. And so these things went hand in hand. It's a surprising thing. But it happened. And the, the great thing must be said about the government of India, that in the government, at the top-notch level, there were people who understood the significance of this, that how technology can be used for development. It will not spread all over India before 2000. Wow, they had predicted uh, that and that. Uh, the Chanda Committee won Chanda Committee. Okay. The report. The, and who had constituted, the, the Prime Minister has constituted the uh, government of India. Government. The government of India has notification. Right. The, they never said that you do what do you know about television, what do you know about everything. They said go ahead and do it. And then many other countries, many other uh, people from uh, uh, USA uh, and uh, UK and France, uh, you name them, they came to Ahmedabad, uh, our center, to learn from us. And they asked us to hold the United Nations uh, uh, 
they provided us uh, UN funds for holding conferences, international conferences, people coming from uh, Latin America, South America, from um, Africa, everywhere we had, we became an international center for software, television. <laughs> and space was uh, became a, they say used to wonder why how these people are managing this so you must have fundamental interest in development and technology is a means to that development and this exactly happened the people uh, before uh, our engineers took up the project they used to ask us how this is going to help the country, how it is going to help the development, how it is going to help the education before they touch the project. So this is a different mindset. And that is why the term ISRO culture has come. ISRO culture in India means that people are not just professionals. They are practical people in love of their country, they are the patriots of the first kind. And this, this, uh, I don't know who, it was, and it must be said uh, about the government, they allowed all these things to happen. They never came and uh, said, uh, you do your business or space, why are we indulging in this thing? In fact, Indira Gandhi used to call us at home in the evening and ask us how, what we were doing. And she was greatly interested in our work of development through television using space communication. And so we got uh, a lot of support from her. And once she supports, who can stop us? So in the beginning, uh, people were saying, uh, uh, let Durdarshan do that, you know, uh, uh, what is business space has to do with television. You do your business of space, you uh, send rockets, satellite, that's okay. But why should you make television program? So this, this concept, we changed completely, that it must read the final map woman and the child in India so that our technology is useful. Wow. Uh -huh. And so today we have satellites, they are reaching the villages with information. Otherwise, India, when British left and Chinese attacked us in 62, we were such a information poor country that even three months after the Chinese attack, not more than 20% of the population, that time it was 40 crores or something, knew about the Chinese aggression. So today, if anything happens anywhere in the country, the whole country knows because it's satellite bone information is spread all over the country in next to no time. So this, this revolution we have created and that reason new India. That is, in, the, in the India you will be surprised to know what country the British left. I don't know what they were doing in the country. It was such a poor state of the country, in education, in social things, everywhere. Of course, partly we ourselves, Indians to be blamed, but the British also as a uh, government in charge. What were they doing? Education, there were hardly few, few universities you can count in the, on the fingertips in the country when they left. But only first three, four countries, uh, Madras, Calcutta, Bombay, 
at Delhi or some, some uh, thing. And um, now look at the number of uh, um, universities in the country. Right. The spread of education. Right. If you go to Kerala, the whole morning you the roads are full of children going to school or returning from school. 100% literacy. Literacy, right. No, and that is spreading to the rest of India. Mm. It is not confined to Kerala anymore. It is spreading to Karnataka, it is spreading to Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, everywhere. And once, and the women, women's education is another great contribution. And women, once they get educated, Nothing will stop them. They are very sincere and they make every use of what they have learned for their own family. So this is a, uh, to me, I don't know why people <laughs> feel that India is not doing well. I have never understood. Because these people do not know India in my opinion. If you go to the grassroots level and see what people are doing, what ordinary people are doing, ordinary people are learning, and now with communication possible, education possible, things are changing very fast. And this has been an amazing experience for me, Professor Chitnis, Yes, having this interaction with you, and thanks for the time. Hello, Dr. Raghi. Myself. Hello. How Hello. are you, Arvin? Dr. Raghi, this is Arvin. Yes, yes, I can see you. I can see you. Thank you. So nice to see you. So nice to see you also. Where are you? I was told that you are not in India. Yes, I'm in California. Oh, good. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we extend our heartfelt thanks to Professor Evie Chitnis for recounting his experiences working on the site experiment. Uh, to introduce our next speaker, Meera B. Aghi, I'd like to call on stage Ms. Maitri Mishra. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure, absolute honor uh, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ira Yaghi. Um, Dr. Aghi is a behavioral scientist and communications expert with outstanding work as a researcher, community health educator, and advocate to prevent uh, tobacco-related diseases has been honored by numerous awards, including the International Network of Women Against Tobacco, um, tribute for 
of standing service to women in 2009 and the Luther Terry Award in 2012. She was also the first woman from Asia to receive the WHO Gold Medal. Dr. Agi has expertise in the design and evaluation of communication and education interventions for behavioral changes with a special focus on the issues of women, children, and tobacco. She obtained her PhD in psychology from Loyola University, Chicago, and has an honorary professorship in uh, behavioral science from Universidad del Salvador, Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. She's an ex-visiting scientist, Harvard School of Public Health, Boston. Dr. Agui has served as a consultant or advisor to numerous global health organizations, including the World Health Organization, um, the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the IDRC, UNESCO, and UNICEF. She's a member of several task forces of the Framework Convention Alliance and is a founding member of INWAP, that is the International Network of Women Against Tobacco, where she continues to serve on the board as South Asia representative. She's also on the board uh, of Human Rights and Tobacco, as well as uh, the union. The union is, uh, um, yes, uh, sorry. Um, and she's affiliated to HELIS as their behavioral scientist. Welcome, Dr. Abhi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here among you, and I feel honored to deliver whatever speech I have prepared in the backdrop with Professor Chitney's interview. I was so moved by his interview. He is so alert even now, and I really salute to him. Okay, now I'm experiencing nostalgia thinking about sight after 45 years. Sight was an experience with no precedents and no follow-ups. It was early 1972 when I had relocated to Denver from Chicago and had gotten a job with the Education Commission of the state, USA. ECS had just initiated work on a project which was going to use NASA satellite to transmit television programs to the Rocky Mountain region. Communication in the Rocky Mountain region was difficult because of the rugged mountain terrain. So NASA designed and launched a special satellite which was geosynchronous. Using a satellite, it would be in overcoming the limitations of laying lines and transmitters on the ground to facilitate communication through television. The project was called Satellite Technology Demonstration. Its goal was the feasibility of a satellite-based media system for isolated rural populations. According to the needs assessment conducted to zero in on the content area to address in the television program, support to the caregivers of zero to five-year-old children emerged as one of the priority areas. This is what I'm talking about, Rocky Mountain experiment. It included anyone who will care for children, like parents, grandparents, babysitters, and also caregivers at foster homes and orphanages. I was employed as the vice president of research, a daunting title for my first job outside the university where I did my PhD. My responsibility was designing television programs directed at caregivers of young children. Now, what made me suitable for this job? The education which I got during my training in early childhood development as a part of the PAT program, early childhood development was my minor. And secondly, the program research experience which I got from Children's Television Workshop, New York, who were the designers of the Sesame Street program for children, where I had apprenticed during my PhD for television program research. This is how I got the job at the 
set up the normal administration at ECS. It was just about the same time that concern was beginning to surface among some quarters in India. This concern was pointing to a need to find a solution to address the education needs of children in rural areas, which Dr. Chitnis spoke so elaborately on. Dr. Sarabhai, uh, Dr. Sarabhai was one person who seemed seriously perturbed about it. He felt the need for more educational outlet schools for children in India. The population of India was multiplying, but schools were not. The number of schools were much less in proportion, with the result that an overwhelming number of children in rural areas were out of school. Children had very limited opportunities to learn. As we all knew, because of the stature of Dr. Sarabhai, he was able to convince Mrs. Indira Gandhi, and Professor Chitnis has already talked about it, the then Prime Minister of India, to reach out to NASA to request it to lend the use of ATS-F satellite, the same satellite that they were using in the STD project for to India for one year. During this time, India could experiment and check the feasibility of the use of satellite to enable it to make television programs to teach children and adults in the rural areas of India. Sure enough, India was able to get its use for one year from NASA. Indian Space Research Organization was entrusted with designing a project called Satellite Instructional Television Experiment, which you have heard about, to address this task. What followed was a sight to behold. And Professor Chitnis has already talked about it. The whole of the government machinery started working in sync with just one focus. Those ministries, which rarely interacted with others, started working towards one sole commitment. It was a proud movement for the country. Everyone was charged. I am only going to talk about the science education programs for rural children, which was my brief. NASA asked UNESCO to bring me to India on a UN mission to help satellite the prototype research and production unit at the Film and TV Institute in Pune. My job was to train producers to produce programs which will make sense for the rural children and will help them understand scientific concepts of everyday living. NASA assumed that my contribution would be very concrete considering I had just done a similar assignment at ECS in Denver and it had good outcome. So here was working with young men and women, helping them design tent of the programs so that the rural children could understand what was shown to them. I humbly say that some of the questions that the interview for Dr. Sarabhai were asking will be embedded here. Some of the question might be answered here. Same was the case with me. All producers were from urban areas and had very little experience with rural children. Same was the case with me. I was also urban. So all our programs were extensively research driven. They were all bottom up. We conducted several research studies, including one on assessing the information needs of the rural children, we also studied their profiles in terms of the kinds of dwellings they lived in, how they interacted with their environments, what was their intake of food and how often did they eat. We also had to determine what their beliefs were like, especially on the scientific phenomena on which we wanted to produce the programs. We had to determine how we could use those beliefs, if at all, to facilitate communication, 
if not how could we how would we wade through those beliefs very very carefully so as not to disturb or irritate the rural population who held those beliefs in any way we also wanted to know what would hold their attention to watch these programs remember the question of interest was there yeah, entertain one men were there and professor chitney said of course the programs have to be entertaining also so we also wanted to know what would hold their attention to watch these programs each day we studied how to make programs which were educational but also entertaining at the same time we used formative research extensively which included where to begin the program where to end it how many pieces of new information to be induced in half an hour program how many old ones to repeat the entry skills were based on information in each assessment of the children and the end point was each time determined by being the new elements in it with their help we discovered what words were better for them to understand the crucial concept remember i said they were all rural and we were all urban so we had to be make very sure that we were not conveying something and they were understanding something else so often we would ask them to give us alternate words that they were used to and we would carefully embed them so that they learn the new words as well because of the methodology of their involvement in the making of the program they got a good understanding of the underlying rationale for the programs it was amazing to see them assert at home when they found that certain things were not being done in keeping with the principles that they were learning from the television programs for example they had been taught in by the program that it was it's very important to eat the first meal of the day for a, we heard that if any of the child was asked to go to school without eating in, in case the meal was not ready they refused to go to school in a nutshell it may not be an exaggeration to say that program produced turned out to be relevant and effective it was in this context that dr dhawan awarded me the distinguished achievement award isro for the development of innovative tv program material in support of satellite instructional television experiment on june on january 26 1976 it would be a huge omission on my part if i do not mention the freedom that the big bosses at deco isro gave me i had met professor yashpal dr chitnis and kiran karnik before joining the isro team as they had come to see me at my home in denver i do not know what they thought of me at the time but i must say that they trusted me they never asked me what i was doing like professor chitnis said nobody ever asked is so what they were doing you know they were they were space scientists but they were doing programming they seemed just content with the results the programs how they turned out i got full support from all of them and my immediate boss dr binod agrawal i hope he is listening to it even went to the extent of going to the villages and doing program research for me the producers who worked on these programs got a lot of exposure and built very good careers for themselves perhaps it will not be out of place to mention that one of the producers by the name arun khopkar received much notice due to these programs in fact he was contacted by the dental unit at the tata institute of fundamental research the premier research organization in india to make a film on tobacco habits and oral cancer the scientists at the dental unit had been 
doing research on this topic for 10 long years they had come to the conclusion that oral precancerous lesions and oral cancer was a consequence of the people indulging in smoke and chew tobacco they knew exactly where the lesion in the oral cavity is likely to occur if the person was a smoker of weed as opposed to chewer of tobacco they also knew exactly where precancerous lesions would develop if women in shrikakulam andhra pradesh continue to smoke weed chutta arun accepted the proposal on the condition that i would be allowed to work on the films with him the boss of the dental unit agreed arun and i made the film which won the president's film award in india it also got citation on the best film on cancer at buenos aires argentina cancer conference that year maybe i should tell the rest of the story as well following that i was asked if i would work with the professionals at the dental unit of tifr and help them design an intervention which would persuade the users of tobacco to give up the habit of smoking or chewing or both if that is what they were indulging in since it was not an area that i had worked in before i was given enough time and help to understand it before i could design the intervention i must admit that i was help as i was helping the user to shed off their addiction i was becoming addicted to the discipline of tobacco control so much so that i ended up telling unesco that i was not going to go back to us at the end of my mission but will stay back and work in india almost four decades have gone by and i'm still working in health risk behaviors thank you very much are you there thank you dr agni for talking to us about the research that went into the site experiment a uh, best of luck with your efforts against tobacco usage i'd like to now ask Mr. Prasid N to call upon our next speaker.
breaking news coming in manipal institute of communication once again has been ranked among the top media and communication institutes in india it's a part of manipal academy of higher education an institution of eminence cut this is what happens when you ask students of media and communication to create a video they just can't stop talking about themselves everything we learn to do here is experiential that's why we rated at the top you could ask the rj if you'd like yep these guys have their own radio station as well sorry guys i'm a little held up right now by the way why do you need visuals for radio good morning manipal gear up for the yakshagana performance tonight a traditional art form like nothing you've seen before Thank you, sir. Good morning, one and all. It takes me, it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome Mr. B. S. Bhatia, uh, the speaker for the day. So, to talk about Mr. Bhatia, Mr. Bupendra Singh Bhatia is an engineer and MBA from IIM Ahmedabad by qualification, and has worked for Indian Space Research Organisation from. 1971 to 2006 from his, where where he retired as a director of the development and educational communication unit during the tenure of 35 years he worked on all major projects of satcom applications including tele education and telemedicine the satcom projects included the satellite in, instructional television experiment the kheda communication project the jahuba development communication project and the training and development communication communication channel all these were pioneering projects in communication that helped lay the foundation for the use of satellite communication for educational and rural development this experiences led to the definition of large scale projects <clears throat> for like edusat gramset in karnataka madhya pradesh bhopal etc as a project director at you said he set up a very large number of network for several univers- universities like ignu delhi ncert vtu ugc aicte and state government like karnataka madhya pradesh orissa and gujarat he initiated the telemedicine activity and set up a telemedical medicine network for cover to cover remote areas like Andaman Nicobar Island, Leh Ladakh, and all district of Jammu and Kashmir, as well as all states of North Eastern region. Networks were set up for Narayana Hridayalaya, Shankar Netralaya, Apollo Hospital, and for CME at SGPGI Lucknow and medical colleges in Orissa. Besides holding senior advisory positions in several national organization like IGNU, UGC. ncert vigyan prasad of dst etc he has been active actively involved at the international levels as follows faculty international space university france fellow east west center hawaii usa member jury international film competition berlin germany consultant international development research center canada member advisory council commonwealth educational media center for asia after superannuation mr bhatia has been consultant to bisag government of gujarat advisory media lab asia delhi consultant dean united world school of business ahmedabad project director gandhi heritage portal sabarmati ashram ahmedabad program director space education vikram sarabhai community science center so uh, let us all uh welcome mr bhatia i i hand over the stage to you thank you sir thank you for the uh, time and the uh, the resource what you will be sharing with us today thank you so much
Sir, uh, please unmute yourself. Okay, now. Okay, now we can. Now, now you can hear, fine. Okay. Yes, sir, we can hear. Sorry, you. sorry for the trouble. Good morning, friends. Sorry for the initial. Suddenly the audio went off. Uh, I see Mira has left. I would have especially like to wish her a good morning. Arvind is of course there. Thank you so much. Uh, I had seen a. Uh, Mira after a very, very long time, and I'm so happy to see her. Uh, coming to site, uh, let me see. See, site, as you already, Professor Chitnis, Binod Agarwal, Arvind, and others have spoken, uh, Pramod Kale has spoken. So most of the aspects of site have been covered, but I still think there are certain things that uh, I would like to emphasize upon. You know, site had it, uh, we know it was a demonstration in satellite broadcasting, and India borrowed the ATS-6 satellite and conducted uh, the experiment by installing reception sets in 2,400 villages in six states of the country. And uh, the experiment was very thoroughly evaluated. As uh, Professor Chitnis also said that we had a large number of social scientists and uh, the experiment was thoroughly evaluated, its impact was evaluated, the feedback was collected, and so many other aspects were uh, studied. There were special studies conducted uh, by uh, social scientists. Mira Agi did the study on science at a uh, uh, science programming, etc. See, the it was like this that the uh, site had a morning transmission which was for children, school children, and it had the evening transmission which was for the general audience. The morning transmission, somebody was asking Professor Chitnis about the teachers. The morning transmission was really looked after by the Ministry of Education and CRT, CIET, with the Central Institute of Educational Technology. And they were responsible for producing the morning programs. The 
evening programs, Doordarshan was responsible for producing. And when the site configuration was defined, I would like to say that they looked at what is the kind of national network that the country should have. And they said that for remote villages, you should have satellite broadcaster, which is direct reception. For big cities, you should have HPT, the high power transmitters. And for small towns, you should have LPT, which is the low power transmitter. So uh, given this national configuration, the experiment had direct reception sets to 2,400 villages in six states, and it had one LPT which was installed in Kheda district and was covering about a thousand villages. This was the overall configuration which was worked out at that time according to the economics prevailing then. Now, of course, the situation has changed. The economics has changed. So DRS has become economical even at every home in the city, which earlier was not considered to be economical. And LPTs were supposed to be put up in smaller towns. So one LPT was put up at Peach in Kheda district, and it covered about a thousand uh, villages of Kheda district. And ISRO was responsible for the production of programs of the Kheda district. This came to be known as Kheda communication project or the Peach transmission. Now, first, if I have to talk about the direct reception site, as I said, it was very thoroughly evaluated. And the results were indicated. I do not know if Vinod Bhai covered the results in his program. But it showed that uh, people learned each and every section of society and each and every subject, whether it was agriculture, health, animal, uh, uh, family planning, etc. And it was the women who learned the most because their initial level was low. In health, people learn more. In agriculture, people less, learn less because their original level was quite high. So that is how the whole evaluation was done. Feedback was collected. And uh, basically, site demonstrated that satellites work and that it can reach out to the whole country. You will be surprised that many people in the government, to begin with, uh, had doubts. I remember a joint secretary in a ministry telling me that satellites, my foot, they will never work in this country. But then he saw, he saw sight. And today we see not only one, but scores of satellites working beautifully and providing coverage to the country. So satellite demonstrated the feasibility. It showed that the rural TV sets can be installed, that they work with great efficiency. The evaluation had shown that uh, TV sets worked with 70% availability, which means at any given point of time, 70% of the TV sets were on and were working. People were viewing these uh, things. And the impact on women, children, etc., was all evaluated and studied. This was about satellite broadcasting. And what did satellite broadcasting bring? It, it was followed by insight. And the private channels came in. Today, our country has more than 900 uh, satellite channels and reaching in all regional languages and everything. So one can say that, OK, site demonstrated the possibility. And today, we have expanded in a great, in a very great manner. And therefore, site is a great institutionalized and success. I would have some doubts about that. Because the purpose of site was to reach the unreached. As Professor Chitnis also said that 20% of the population did not know about the Chinese aggression or whatever. Uh, even today, while we feel that there are 900 channels and every house has a TV set and this and that and all that, the 20% of the Indian lower income population does not have access to TV set. And while we may think that we have a great uh, this thing, the lowest section of society, which has no uh, access to any media, whether it is print media, whether it is audio media, whether it is uh, video media, and that still remains unreached. And therefore, while satellite broadcasting has come in, the reaching to the lowest section has remained 
still desirable and wanted. The purpose of the low power transmitters was really to reach out to the rural areas in a most economical manner. We had the peak transmitter and we ran it for more than 20 years. Now here, uh, we had morning, uh, we had uh, programs for school children, and we also had programs for adult audience. This became a great learning uh, experience. In fact, uh, Professor Chitnis mentioned it was this project which received the UNDP Development Communication of UNESCO Prize. Uh, the main thing here was how the programs were produced. Let me give you one or two examples. For example, taking agriculture. The normal method was, okay, you call the expert to the studio and he talks to the audience and gives them recommendation about better agricultural practices, better seeds, better fertilizers, etc., etc. But when we, when we went to the field, the farmers told, we know all about all this. Uh, we have heard enough from our agriculture extension worker about better seeds and this thing. Our problem is to get a loan. How to get a loan from them? So we came to know that sitting in the studio, you were making programs which were away from the need of the audience. So we said, okay, let us go and work with the bank. That time there was a lead uh, bank, Bank of Baroda there. And we went and told them that we would like to make programs so that uh, rural audiences can take loan. When they looked at their own pro uh, processes, they said, no, no, our process is long. Let us simplify our process. They simplified the process. And then they started, uh, we started making programs on how to take loan. Now, suddenly what happened was in one of, in some village, when the, the producer went, the people were very, Worked up. They said that we have received a notice from the bank that we have taken loan, whereas we have not taken any loan. And they are being asked to repay the loan. Now, this became another issue. So, uh, the producer went to the bank, and the bank manager disappeared. The pro uh, producer went to the district collector. The district collector said, Okay, let me go and find out what has happened. Uh, so we, we recorded all this and we kept transmitting to tell the villagers that we are looking into it. Then the collector went to the village and came back. So we asked the villagers what happened. They said nothing. He just came and sat with the serpent and went away. So we had to further take the problem up. Ultimately, the problem had to be taken to the chief minister's level. The chief minister at that time was Shri Babu Bhai Jashwai Patel. And... Uh, he, when the producer and researcher talked to him, he called a meeting and then he had the problem sorted out. And of course, uh, Maubai told the researcher that if you show, show such programs, you will be showing us in poor light. But she uh, very correctly mentioned to him that, sir, if you solve the problem just as you did now, you will come out in very good light. So... This showed that the medium had to become a medium of communication, not only from top to the bottom, but from bottom to the top. Take the issues of the people and take it further. And try and involve the people and try and resolve the solutions of the people. So that is why how the upward communication, flow of communication, we started seeing. Then some of the experiences of the farmers, especially in one area, to be carried to the other. And so we would make the programs with the farmers as to how they went about and how they shared their experiences with the others. And this led to what we may call the horizontal communication between the one, uh, farmers of one village to that of the other. So instead of only top-down communication, we added bottom-up communication and horizontal communication. Along with this, what we did was to bring in participation. Just as we said, we went to the audience and we came to know about their issues. 
people started sending stories, especially school teachers and others. And our producers would encourage them to write. They, in fact, conducted workshops in the rural areas. So the teachers, students, and other educated people who sit down and write scripts by observing what is happening around them. And a whole series was started called Tamara TV Mate Tamil Lako, which meant write for your own TV. So people started writing. And they started participating in the program. The person who had written the script was invited on screen. And he would say how he observed this in the village and how he has now turned it into a TV serial program. Then the people who got more and more uh, encouraged to write, people started writing second time, third time, and more workshops were conducted. So another series was started called Hum Have La Kunchu. I now write. And this way, the whole series, the participation of the people in the programs increased very greatly. Then one producer, uh, Mira didn't mention him, but was very close, Mr. Vishwanath. He started producing a series program on untouchability. A very serious and very sensitive topic. And he used some urban actors uh, for uh, these uh, stories. Actually, the whole thing started that uh, some letter came from the village where they wrote that uh, our one person died a, of a lower caste. And uh, at the same time, the buffalo of a rich man died in the village. And the rich man insisted that his buffalo should be first removed and then they can cremate the uh, person who had died. So they wrote this story. And uh, based on this story, the producer went to make the program. When he recorded the uh, story of the villagers, in the evening, the villagers came running to the studio. And they said, sir, please do not transmit this program. So he said, why? He says, if you transmit this program, tomorrow we will all be beaten up. So please save us from this trouble and do not transmit the program. So what the producer did, he tried to convert it into a play. And he hired some uh, urban artists to uh, play it out on the screen. But when the urban artists were playing and the rural audience saw them, saw them playing, they told them, no, 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 the, the, this is not the way the landlord behaves, or this is not the way. So they started acting. And uh, Vishwanath then decided to remove all the artists and use villagers as the artists. And therefore, a greater participation, so participation in writing, participation in acting, participation in contributing to stories, and the local program production really became participative. So it became research oriented. It became, for research, for example, I will tell you, a health program. Now, if you want to make a health program and you invite an expert, the expert comes with his uh, chart of balanced diet. And he will tell the audience, uh, drink milk, eat eggs, eat fish, high protein, this, that, and all that. So when he was making the program, the researcher told him, sir, our villagers are, first of all, vegetarians. They don't eat uh, fish and egg, and they don't eat this kind of food. So they said, okay, then you tell me what do they eat. So the researcher went to the field and came back with a report of what the uh, rural audience eats. So he told them they eat khichdi, they eat uh, sabji, they eat a little gold, and that kind of thing. So now the expert had to work out his recommendations based on what the audience was eating. So he said, recommended that, okay, increase the proportion of dal in your uh, khichdi so that the protein uh, increases. Do not cut your vegetables very fine and do not wash them after cutting so that the vitamins do not flow away. So the whole recommendations and the program production completely changes when your content is research-based and audience-based. So this uh, way, we 
uh, continued making the programs more and more participate and media became a channel two way channel for uh, this thing and this resulted in reaching out to the rural community viewing to the lowest strata of society because once it is community viewing the richer uh, audience of the village may not like to come and sit with the uh, rural or uh, the poorer audiences and therefore you are reaching out to the really poor section of the society now when we saw that this was the re and, uh, real way of re reaching the uh, lower strata of society the question now is have we replicated why do we conduct an experiment we conduct an experiment to demonstrate the technology to demonstrate its feasibility and to demonstrate its effectiveness satellite broadcasting was more than adequately demonstrated by site and it was quickly picked up by the political forces and uh, the government decided to go in for a national network that is how the big national network came up. the commercial forces immediately started and we got into direct broadcasting it went into through a whole process of evolution and today we have more than 900 satellite channels in the country so tremendous the commercial forces have taken uh, charge the political forces have taken charge but the development issues still remain unanswered and therefore i personally believe that the communication institutes need to address this issue how can we reach out to the lowest society i is in your uh, ad i saw how you probably have a local radio station at manipal local radio stations have come up in various educational institutes i do not know how the local radio station at manipal is functioning but uh, in many places it is uh, it has not been used that effectively as i said a local medium can be used so i personally believe that a time has come where we need to define a new call it a new site experiment or a experiment with the new media which we have today with the objective of reaching out to the rural audiences it could be radio tv it could be an integrated testing uh, and you could uh, see tv transmission local local transmission today there are more than 800 lpts in this country which means every district has one lpt and therefore if the local institute tries to work with the ministry you can take a half an hour slot on the lpt and transmit radio uh, transmit tv programs you can also have non broadcasting mode you have youtube and various other things and i think a totally new configuration needs to be defined to reach out to the poor section of rural society and this only communication institutes like manipal and a few others you must try it out even if even if you take just one taluka one taluka or one block has about 100 villages you may select just 50 out of them and have a configuration which will reach out to the poorer section of society can you have local lpts can you use your local radio broadcasting can you use non broadcasting mode can you use youtube can you use so many other because the technology has changed today we are no more in the uh, situation where we were when we started sight when we started sight there was no tv in this country there was no broadcasting there was uh, no electronics today we are full nobody ever thought that a kind of ground network will become available today it has become available but nothing is serving the cause of development everything is serving the cause either of politics or of commercial and therefore it is my sincere urge to manipal 
and to other institutes is to try and work out an experiment in this. The second thing which I really uh, feel strongly, which uh, we should, the communication institute should work, is for developing communication research. Today, the one thing which is totally absent from the communication field or from TV field is research. The only research that you have is TRP, which is, we know what, what is happening at there. But no audience research is there. Nobody is, can, we are making programs for children. Mira just described how they studied the needs of the children. The, are we doing any such thing? No. We are just bombarding our children with programs, not knowing what effect these programs have on the children. I think the communication research conducted abroad by various universities and by various uh, even production companies is much, much, and the guidelines developed for uh, children's programs are much stricter than what we have, we have in our country. Similarly, for women's program, what do we have? We have family serials going on and on. Are we addressing any serious issue of society today. We have such uh, uh, crimes against women happening. And what are we, what is the television doing about it, except reporting in the news and sensationalizing it? Does, is there any educational effort? What is the image of our program, police? What is the image of our uh, politicians? Are, are all the policemen so corrupt? Are all the politicians so corrupt? Probably not. How can we use our media to improve this? And that can be done only if there is a meaningful research and an effort to use this medium meaningfully. Otherwise, if the only purpose is to show advertisement and uh, this thing and sensationalize, I think that would be a very sad thing. I personally get very disturbed when I see all this happening and uh, the students uh, the, the children are being fed with all kinds of uh, useless programs. The youth is not being given any direction in its, uh, whether it is career or something. And let me tell you, for example, today I see educational programs. On the one hand, you have Baiju, which is making millions. We made educational programs, but we were making programs for children who could not pay. When you are making, Baidu is making programs or such similar channels for children who can pay. And they, therefore, it's a commercial activity. Whereas when NCRT, CIT, and ISRO or science programs were being produced, it was not a commercial activity. It was an activity which was educational. And great, by the way, Mira didn't go into the details of the science programs, but people like Rosa Yashpal, Chitness and so many others had contributed great deal in developing the approach to programming. Today we have no approach to programming, and I blame the academicians. I hope uh, Manipal faculty is also listening. All these institutes really need to push research and to do some research and give feedback to the people that you are doing damage to the society. Please don't do this. Please do this. Only if the researchers will make will come up with some recommendations, with come come up with some research, then and then we will be able to have a much better television in this uh, so in this country. So I hope uh, the researchers will work towards uh, developing, uh, uh, really introducing communication research, which will include research before the program, formative research, audience profiles, needs assessments, and the like, and feedback. Today we have no feedback on the content of the program. Our producers are just not uh, worried about collecting any feedback. They just keep dragging on the serials one after another, one thing after another, till the TRB goes down, then they close it and start up with something else. So communication research, is seriously missing from the seal. And I would urge institutes like uh, 
Manipal to really try and see if we can introduce some communication research in the communication field. And development communication is completely missing. It has gone down and it is there is a serious need. And I hope uh, some institutes, I do not know what Institute of Mass Communication is there. There are so many other institutes, but we seem to have just been flooded with the glamour of commercialization and politicization and the complete education and development portion has been suppressed. I hope uh, this will get some notice at the academics and the other people who are uh, in this and we, we will be able to initiate some activity to increase research in the communication scene in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Will the anchor please take over? I think. Uh, thank you, sir. We thoroughly appreciated your insights into how SITE helped advance the spread of education in India. And do hope that, uh, like how you want, that we can envision a similar experiment to SITE that reaches out to the rural audience. To call upon our next speaker, Mohan J. Datta, I'd like to welcome Professor Shruti V. Shetty onto the stage. Good morning and a warm welcome to all. I'm Shruti V. Shetty, faculty at uh, Manipal Institute of Communication. This webinar uh, commemorating the birth centenary of Vikram Sarabhai has had some prolific speakers so far. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this session, Professor Mohan J. Datta. Professor Datta, an alumnus of IIT Kharagpur and University of Minnesota, is the director of Center for Culture-Centered Approach to Research and Evaluation, Care, and Dean's Chair, Professor of Communication at School of Communication, Journalism, and Marketing, Massey University. He has been the head of Department of Communications and New Media, National University of Singapore, and an adjunct professor with Brian Lab School of Communication, Purdue University and the Center for Poverty and Health Inequities. As the director of care, he is involved in developing culturally centered community-based projects of social change, advocacy, and activism that articulate health as human right. He sits on the advisory group, Cultural Context of Health, of the World Health Organization Europe. Noted as one of the most prolific and highly cited scholars in health communication. He's a winner of Louis Donahue Outstanding Scholar in Health Communication and the Pride Award in Public Relations. Professor Datta's research examines the role of advocacy and activism in challenging marginalized structures, the relationship between poverty and health, political economy of global health policies, the mobilization of cultural tropes for justification of neo-colonial health development projects, and the ways in which participatory culture-centered processes and the strategies of radical democracy serve as axis of global social change. In 2020, mm -hmm. Professor Datta has been named as named a fellow of the International Communication Association and has been awarded by National Communication Association Golden Anniversary Monograph Award 2020 the NCA Charles H. Wilbert Research Award 2020, and NCA Dale E. Brasher Distinguished Mentor 2020 Awards. Sir, it's a privilege to have you uh, speak in the session. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and it really is an honor to be in this space. Um, uh, can you hear me all properly? Great. So I'll take about great. So I'll take about 
40 minutes is that uh, okay okay yes. lovely i will go ahead and uh, share my screen now so i initially frame my talk as decolonizing communication um, theory and i thought that i will change that a little bit and uh, instead uh, talk about theories of the global south it says my screen is disabled can someone enable it so screen this sh uh, share the screen again please uh, it was a technical difficulty yeah it says host disabled participant screen sharing try now sir uh, please try again sir Okay. Yes, sir. It's, it's working now. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. So I thought I'll talk about theories of the global south and use site as an anchor to theorizing from the global south and really imagining what communication theory looks like from within uh, the context and the worldview of uh, site. Of course, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the uh, visionaries, the leaders of communication theorizing and research um, that are uh, sitting in this room. I think um, it is uh, their generosity that actually um, holds many of us up. In fact, um, you know, I was talking to Professor Urban Singhal the other day, and uh, he was discussing how do we build architectures of mentorship and nurturing uh, that support others and lift others up. And I think that I have really benefited from uh, many of the people um, uh, that are in this space uh, that have uh, gone ahead of me, um, their generosity and their mentorship, and particularly uh, the work that they have done in paving the way for empirical communication theorizing grounded in the global South. I particularly want to uh, thank the uh, generosity of uh, Professor Arvind Sinha, uh, Dr. Vinod um, Agarwal, um, uh, Nosh Contractor, Arvind Singhal, uh, uh, Srinivas Melkote, uh, all of them have been interlocutors in this journey and what I will draw upon builds upon um, the work uh, that they have done and the contributions they have made. You know, talking about generosity, I just wanted to uh, uh, share a quick story to uh, articulate what I mean by building infrastructures of mentoring and nurturing. Uh, nurturing. You know, this image that you see on the uh, right hand of my screen, right to me, um, is a set of books. Now, when I was uh, head of the Department of Communications at um, New Media at National University of Singapore, uh, Professor Ang Peng Hua, who was at uh, Nanyang Technological University, a neighboring university, uh, carried these books in a bag for me all the way from Ahmedabad. Um, gifted by Professor um, Agarwal. And um, that really has stayed as an inspiration to me in terms of really thinking about uh, my own theorizing of um, the necessity of building infrastructures in the global south and how that really calls upon a framework of generosity and a commitment to uh, generous uh, sharing, mentorship, and uh, nurturing. So I will talk about some of the key principles of sight at a meta level. You know, I was born in the year 1973. So I think I'm pretty poorly equipped given all the scholars that you have heard around the room, uh, talking about the specifics and the minutiae of the sight program. But I will take some meta commentary and meta concepts in uh, thinking through what are some of the key lessons um, from sight about the nature of communication. and. Uh, the relationship of communication to uh, public life, to how our uh, societies, our politics, our economics ought to be. And I will see that as a framing of Southern theory and uh, hopefully offering us um, a way to think about how we imagine the future from our locations in the global South. I will situate that in conversation with communication so white. You know, one of the conversations that I have often had uh, with Professor Sinha is that um, as a student of communication, and after I finished my uh, Bachelor of Technology in Agricultural Engineering at um, IIT Kharagpur, and you know the reason why I came into communication 
was because I really felt that my engineering training at IIT was um, very poorly equipped in um, addressing the kinds of challenges of development, um, addressing the kinds of challenges of poverty and well-being that were faced by very disenfranchised uh, communities um, uh, that um, I was um, engaging in conversations with. And that sort of um, uh, sent me on this pathway of exploring uh, communication. And I initially went into agricultural communication and then from there into communication. And one of the things I noticed in sort of my years of communication training was the whiteness of the discipline. And at the same time, the simultaneous erasure of um, articulations and uh, theoretical uh, framings from the elsewhere of the world. So I will uh, talk about the erasure of sight, but also how I see then uh, sight as a point of intervening into the whiteness of communication theory. It is in that backdrop, then I will talk about what are some of the key issues we ought to be thinking about um, when considering theories of the global south, and that will offer us a way for framing imaginaries of communication. So when we look at sight as a Southern intervention, as an intervention in the global South, um, I want to contextualize sight within the context of uh, the broader questions of India's development, uh, questions that were deeply anchored in um, the fundamental tenets of uh, the Indian uh, constitution, uh, uh, the tenets of um, uh, building India as um, a socialist, secular, democratic republic. So I want to highlight those three key elements, the imaginary of building India as a socialist, secular, democratic republic. So in that sense, the imaginary of sight in uh, post-colonial India, post-independence, and emergent from that narrative of post-independence is one of seeing development and the role of communication with the relationship to development as one of public infrastructures of communication. So communication in that sense as a public commitment to serve the people, but people meaning uh, those at the margins of uh, society, uh, those that uh, struggle with the everyday conditions of living and livelihood, with the idea that communication can support and bring about uh, changes in their lives which would contribute to development. So communication infrastructures in this imaginary are infrastructures of public goods. So this, of course, uh, plays out from sight into the uh, Keda experiments into uh, Doodarshan and uh, the public programming and public educational programs of Doodarshan, built on the idea that communication infrastructures are uh, public goods that have uh, fundamental roles to play in the development of the publics. And again, when I say publics with a basic commitment to uh, a large portion of India that struggle with uh, livelihood, that struggle with uh, uh, the fundamental uh, problems of poverty, of uh, having adequate food, clothing, uh, shelter, having access to education. So communication infrastructures for development in this sense are also infrastructures for education with a commitment to serving the needs of those who are most disenfranchised. So the question of course here bec uh, becomes one of what role can communication play to serve the needs of the margin? So the distribution of communication infrastructures is particularly attentive to addressing the needs of the margins. The infrastructures for research and knowledge generation in the global south particularly within the context of site and uh, the work that emerges from site is situated in relationship with this fundamental question then, um, which is that how could public communication infrastructures serve as tools of education um, and, uh, for engaging with disenfranchised communities, communities in poverty. And this is of course embedded in the context of everyday lives of communities at the margin. So, if you think about um, the many conversations around site, I was listening to uh, the talk by um, uh, Dr. Um, Agarwal and uh, Sinhan. They were talking about how there were so many layers of um, uh, um, embedding uh, the research instruments, the methodologies and the everyday lives of people all the way from culture to context, to lived experiences 
to their participation. So many of these conversations that were taking place inside um, actually are conversations that we are returning to uh, today. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the, the kinds of tensions that are taking place in the communication discipline um, in um, a post-pandemic world, uh, one of the fundamental transformations is one of how do we challenge the uh, whiteness and the US centrism of the discipline. And many of the questions that are being raised are uh, ones of how do we take context into account? How do we theorize context um, uh, based upon empirical experiences um, from the elsewhere outside of uh, the US white mainstream uh, uh, subject populations? These kinds of questions were being grappled with at site uh, many decades uh, before they have re-arrived uh, today. So it is in this backdrop that I want to talk about uh, the movement of communication so right and what I thought I would juxtapose in the backdrop of what I discuss is this image from the work of care that we do with um, uh, PV Satish and uh, the women farmers organized under Deccan Development Society um, in the women's sanghams uh, working around this imaginary of agriculture and how do you um, reimagine agriculture uh, from the standpoints of climate resilience, climate change adaptation, and uh, sustainability of agrarian communities. Um, and I juxtapose that picture because what I want to highlight is that the whiteness of communication as a discipline has worked uh, through the erasure of the agency of the peoples of the global south. So whiteness, in terms of how you define it, is that um, it is the dominant value of white culture that is accepted as universal. So uh, the fundamental ideological um, uh, architectures of white culture are presumed to be, uh, first of all, um, uh, universal. And uh, secondly, uh, they are uh, presumed to actually be the prescriptions for communities and for peoples elsewhere. So uh, taken for granted in uh, that, uh, architecture of whiteness is the ability of peoples of the global south to theorize. The south is turned into a theoretical body, you know, bodies on which uh, uh, development must be mapped on so that the knowledge production and the uh, conversations of knowledge can take place within um, uh, the corridors of the white academy in the U.S., so this kind of production of knowledge is embedded in the, individual, uh, in the ideology of individualism. So of course, this also plays out in how we imagine uh, development and communication where it is uh, the individual, his or her beliefs, his or her attitudes and behaviors that are the problem which are then turned into sites of interventions, communication, seeking to change those beliefs, attitudes and behaviors, of course, entirely oblivious to communities, to collectives, to groups, relationships, families, and the broader structures within which um, individuals inhabit their lives. Uh, the production of knowledge simultaneously uh, makes claims that are embedded in the ideology of the enclosures of the commons. So this is a really important point um, to work through, that enclosing the commons and turning the commons into privatized resources is a fundamental strategy of whiteness. And of course, this strategy has been um, historically and systematically uh, resisted by peoples across the global south. Here in Aotearoa, for instance, or in New Zealand, when we work with the Maori communities, uh, one of the things um, you uh, see in the imaginaries of uh, Maori worldview is the idea of uh, panangatanga, the idea that everyone is connected, every life form is connected, and that becoming the basis for how we organize agriculture, how we organize our relationship with uh, Papakatano, which is the earth and the environment, and how do we see our roles as the uh, stewards and guardians of the environment. Now, that kind of articulation that um, uh, seeks a different set of relationships with the commons are often treated as primitive, as backward, which need to be changed through the uh, white logics of um, enclosure of the commons, into privatization and therefore offering privatized solutions. Uh, in this sense, then the production of knowledge claims from structures of whiteness erase the sovereignty of communities in the global south. You know, um, my early work, I talked about 
um, being an agricultural engineer. And uh, some of my earliest work uh, was with Santali communities in eastern parts of India. Um, and often the Santalis will uh, talk about um, uh, the notion of um, uh, spirits residing in trees and the importance of protecting trees as fundamental to any imaginary of development. So stewardship of forest in their imaginary was a key element in how uh, development could be conceptualized. Similarly, in uh, the Maori worldview, um, uh, for instance, uh, the notion of community sovereignty or tinoranga tiratanga is built upon the idea that uh, indigenous people as protectors of the land ought to um, uh, determine what development is, the structures of development, the framings of development, and actively participate in imagining the kinds of solutions that are meaningful. So note here that the notion of participation is not simply something uh, superficial to uh, think about how to produce a television program or radio program by bringing in audiences, but fundamentally about transforming what development is, what are the architectures and imaginaries of development, and how can it be conceptualized through other imaginations. Now, these kinds of erasures of the knowledge capacities of the peoples of the global south, their sovereignties is also tied to the erasure of the labor of the peoples in the global south. And this is something that um, I have argued in multiple speeches and writings, uh, which is that um, the intellectual labor and the material labor of the peoples of the global south is strategically erased in order to prop up whiteness. So I remember, you know, when as a communication student in a PhD program in the 1990s, I entered into the PhD program, I would um, hear about um, uh, the big father figures of communication, the learners and the uh, shrams, uh, but there is no discursive register to learn about um, uh, the works of the Agarwals and the Sinas. And that kind of erasure is strategic erasure that actually works to prop up the whiteness of the discipline. So in that sense, um, uh, the conversations on site as a site of uh, knowledge production from the global south is also about dismantling um, that kind of erasure that forms the whiteness of communication. Now, this whiteness with its ideology of um, individualization and uh, privatization then, uh, walks directly into the neoliberal reforms of the globe, uh, all the way from consolidation of power, the production of uh, deep inequalities, uh, the privatization of agriculture through technocentric logics, uh, the extension of this, of course, are the farm bills uh, that turn agriculture into a commodity to be served through the free market with the idea that somehow the free market would magically uh, deliver upliftment, which, of course, has not been held up empirically across the globe. This is also then tied to the consolidation of land and markets to serve capitalist interests, the privatization of public resources, including resources of health and science, the production of scientific knowledge itself uh, today is consolidated in the hands of capital uh, to the point where uh, the public support for scientific knowledge. So most of the, um, the research, for instance, you take COVID, most of the research uh, that drives um, the COVID vaccine work takes place in uh, public settings funded by taxpayers, but then is quickly turned around into a private commodity that is commercialized and generates massive profits for transnational pharmaceutical comp uh, corporations. So uh, this public-private is really interesting because the public is reworked to serve the interests of the uh, uh, private. This has been accompanied by attacks on unions, um, and oh, un underlying all of this is the ideology of individualism and techno-determinism, sort of a techno-fetish that sees the market as uh, the mediated through technology as offering the solutions to problems of development. Simultaneously, we see ongoing attack on communities, on collectives, and depletion of communities and collectives, and accompanying that is an infrastructure of hate and majoritarianism. So as collectives and the ability of collectives to bargain and to resist and to fight for the commons has been depleted. Um, infrastructures of hate and majoritarianism have been propped up that serve the interests of capital and their uh, political and economic logics. So in that sense, communication now 
within the neoliberal framework of whiteness works mediated through technology and uh, sites of technological cooptation into the market civil society state mix with the market really taking the chunk of it, the private interests organizing the state and civil society to serve it and reworking democracy, academia, cultural production um, uh, spaces in order to serve the interests of profiteering and privatization of the market while simultaneously incorporating the subaltern and his or her body as sites of profiteering. So some, one of the phenomena that you see across the globe then is that as um, uh, subaltern communities, as disenfranchised communities are displaced from land and land forms the frontiers of global capital today, um, they are thrown into networks of uh, migrant labor, precarious labor without uh, protection. So this is the other side of neoliberal capital uh, with a tremendous uh, forms of exploitation without access to opportunities of um, unionizing. And all of this often takes place under the rhetoric of development as uh, a neoliberalism. So what the way I theorized then the notion of the erasure of global South is to argue that the communicative inequality, the depletion of the agentic capacities of the peoples of the global South and the reproduction of these communicative inequalities is integral to the reproduction, reification, and circulation of structural um, inequalities. So certainly today you have proliferation of uh, communication channels. So you look at the satellite space in India, uh, there are the proliferation of uh, 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 digital and satellite channels. Um, there is proliferation of uh, um, various modes of monetizing those channels, but simultaneously spaces of representation and recognition of the margins of disenfranchised communities have been systematically erased, have been systematically co-opted. And that is what lies at the heart of the production of structural inequalities. So the culture-centered approach, you know, the work that I have been doing grapples with this idea, how do we build theories of and from uh, the South? And this is where what Professor Singel was talking about in terms of building architectures is really uh, vital. And I thought, you know, I will um, uh, take a picture of this uh, book that Urban had um, given me. And he had said to Mohan, he still talks about sight, uh, so good to hear. <laughs> and um, um, I think that um, uh, that that is an example of an architecture of communication. The, the idea that we still talk about and the relevance of this conversation and bringing it back to our models of theorizing is fundamental to building uh, the basis for another imagination. Um, in the words of Gayatri Spivak, uh, the question becomes one of how do we learn to learn from below with an ethic of humility? How do we build an ethic of patient listening to the other uh, that inverse the dominant structures of meaning making? So when I talk about communicative equality then, and I will quickly go through this because I do want to give you a couple of examples to walk through. Uh, communicative equality then refers to the simple question of uh, how do we imagine and produce spaces of equality in the distribution of information resources, resources of representation, decision-making and voice. And then what connects that, how that connects to our work is in terms of really asking the question, how do we build um, equality in the ownership of fundamental uh, democracies across the global South? Because uh, to me, sight is an exemplar of building the logics of democracy at the margins uh, through the building of information resources in public ways, through the building of information infrastructures in uh, public ways. So um, how do we build resources for representation so that uh, the margins can actually have access to uh, spaces where their voices can be heard, not listened to just, but heard in ways that matter so that that shapes actions and policies? And how do we build resources for voice? So, you know, this is again an image from uh, the work uh, with uh, the women um, in DDS. Uh, and this also aligns well with the work of Vinod Pavrala and Kanchan Malik, uh, which is, you know, with the example of community radio, how do you build infrastructures for ownership of information resources all the way from uh, being able to make knowledge claims to accessing structural resources to decision-making processes? 
how do we own um, infrastructures of representation or how do communities at the margins own infrastructures of representation? And then how do communities at the margins own infrastructures for voice so that they can have an effect on policy so that they can make decisions uh, that retain their sovereignty so that they can access structural resources? How, for instance, do migrant workers have access to communicative platforms so that they can uh, sh shape policies that actually impact their lives in meaningful ways, rather than um, uh, these uh, extreme neoliberal policies implemented in ways that further produce their marginalization and precarity? How do we build infrastructures for making knowledge claims? So in that sense, I see communication as being tied to power and the question of voice. You know, this is um, from the work uh, that I have been doing in rural Bengal for, you know, since uh, 1998. So it's um, uh, over uh, two decades now, really. And I keep returning to this work as a way to anchor me in this idea that actually when you listen to communities and their voices, they will tell you uh, what imaginaries they see as uh, the basis for building development, building democracy, and organizing democracy so that development serves the interests of uh, people at the margins. Um, I, I wanted to you know, take a couple of excerpts because I talk about voice. So it makes sense that we uh, hear about, uh, hear voices from some of our field work. So this is an example of what I mean by voice infrastructures as material interventions. And you, here you have, you know, the women of the DDS who are organized into sanghams or women's cooperatives actually taking their seed banks um, on a bullock cart from village to village while singing songs. Um, so I will just play this a little bit for you. <laughs> So those bullock cars are carrying the seeds. And uh, these are seeds that are stored by the women in the seed banks and are distributed freely in the community. Again, um, um, inter interrogating and um, interrupting and disrupting the idea that seeds are private resources owned by corporations. And their singing in that sense becomes a voice infrastructure for this very material intervention. So building this work of communi uh, community communication infrastructures um, is one about um, uh, really seeing how those at the margins can participate, how they can analyze power and look at the interplays of power, examine their erasures, and then challenge these erasures through their, through their presence in um, uh, spaces of voice democracy, building pedagogies and everyday habits of democracy. And this becomes so vital especially as we uh, watch the ways in which um, uh, digital platforms, you know, platforms such as Facebook and Twitter have been deployed by infrastructures of hate, politics and private capital to actually silence and erase. And, you know, in my work, I talk about this as an irony. So on one hand, it appears that we have proliferation of voices, but really what is happening at the heart is um, um, uh, voices are co-opted to uh, uh, serve particular architectures of hate, to serve the interests of private capital on the other hand, and political forces that profit from uh, the selling and the marketing of hate. So within that backdrop, that question becomes, how do we build pedagogies of democracy? And I think that is the fundamental question for me um, in the lessons from SITE. How do we build communication pedagogy for interventions? How do we anticipate and build strategies for responding to these uh, structures of hate, optation, and privatization. This is just another example. Uh, this is, you know, my work with uh, Santalis in um, Eastern India. I will just play a little bit of an excerpt. <laughs> so, in, in this context, 
um, you see them performing. Uh, but in this context, the work as identified by them becomes one of protecting uh, their natural resources through songs and dances and their relationships with uh, nature. You know, and you see similar kinds of threads in Maori uh, struggles here in Aotearoa in terms of how do they protect their relationship with nature in the face of the extreme aggression of uh, neoliberal forces. So when we build these infrastructures of listening, we actually create spaces of change. This is Nadamma, who is um, a lead community organizer in our, our work at DDS. And she says, when we hold these cameras, we tell our stories. When we run the radio station in the community, we tell the stories grounded in our lives. So it's not the money that the big people pay to sell their version. So this is really talking about the advertising-based uh, dominant model which is always about making profit by making fools of us. So on the radio, these are stories of what farmers are really going through here in Warongal and in Pastapur. So uh, this I find to be a poignant narrative, especially within the context of the epidemic of farmers. Suicides, the ongoing attacks on farmers, their lives and livelihoods by uh, cycles of neoliberal reforms. So the work of then challenging this erasure from the global south becomes one of thinking of knowledge production itself as political work, you know, and, and, and this is critical because I think we have been trained in the um, US centric white model to think of our work as um, universal and apolitical, but actually all along uh, that mainstream work has been one of politics, a politics that served the interests of private capital and privatization. So for us to challenge that is to really reimagine what could our work as political work look like when we are intervening from the struggles in the global south, asking questions such as who produces knowledge, who produces cultural artifacts, who measures and evaluates these artifacts, who funds the production, circulation, and consumption of knowledge slash culture, and what are the possibilities of knowledge production outside the logics of capital? And I have shown you um, just a couple of examples to demonstrate that these imaginaries exist uh, when we listen to the voices of the margins. So in that sense, listening becomes a way for us to disrupt these silences as an entry point to imagining alternative social, political, and economic structures, and as a framework for making impure or rendering um, impossible the dominant categories and ideologies of communication in the service of uh, participation. So, you know, I want to leave you with some methods questions really, and uh, this uh, follows uh, nicely uh, from the conversation that uh, we had uh, earlier with uh, Dr. Khatia in terms of how do we listen to the margins? How do we learn to learn from the margins? What resources are necessary to build infrastructures of listening in our societies, especially when so much of our communication education and our training of students has turned into a skills factory uh, for serving the infrastructures of capital and frankly, for serving the infrastructures of hate. So um, I suggest that we seriously think about how we build our communication pedagogy and, and really think about um, interrogating, for instance, our commitments. So what, when, what happens when uh, so many of our students actually graduate from our programs and go to work for hate machines like Republic TV, which uh, uh, circulate uh, fake news and propaganda. And we fundamentally have to interrogate then what becomes our role as communication educators and what are the communicative strategies do we build for responding to the silencing and the violence in the dominant structures? And what are the resources we build for community anchored solidarities for voices at the margins? So I want to move toward the end by showing you some work from um, uh, you know, our collaborations with indigenous communities here in New Zealand. And this is um, a project that is driven by indigenous communities on the question of land rights. So I would, uh, you know, thinking about the concept and the method of listening and asking when voices speak, what imaginaries do we offer? I invite you to listen to uh, uh, this particular video, which is made by um, indigenous community members at the margins.
So Penua is land, and, and this struggle emerges within the context of the confiscation of indigenous land. And uh, the articulation here is one about the sacred relationship with the land where ancestors reside. And when voices speak, an alternative rationality such as this, that relationships with land are uh, sacred, offer a basis for fundamentally inverting our dominant approaches to development and communication. So then the question becomes, when we think about building such infrastructures, uh, they are going to come under attack, of course, uh, because the work of development and communication becomes one of uh, activism in solidarity with communities at the margins. And uh, think about the dominant structures of whiteness that we talked about. And of course, um, most of our uh, hegemonic structures within nation states have been reorganized to serve these structures of whiteness. So when there are challenges placed to these structures, there are going to be systematic and system uh, sustained attacks on communication infrastructures. There are going to be violent, uh, uh, forms of direct violence or threats of violence. There are going to be strategies of co-optation, co manipulation, stigmatization, using legislation and the law to incarcerate um, activists and communities at the margins. So thinking through these challenges then um, imagine invites us to imagine how can we build communication sovereignty? What strategies do we ne need to build the sovereignty of our communicative spaces? How do we build creative responses to that onslaught of those dominant forces of neoliberalism? How do we co-create infrastructures and resources for support and plural networks of solidarity? that stand beside communities at the margins. And you know, what we have learned from our work is it's important to attend to timing, uh, timing in terms of thinking through the appropriate entry points for uh, building transformative uh, registers, important to strategize presence in terms of when are we going to be present in which discursive spaces. It's important to connect struggles across spaces so that you build communities and you uh, build these infrastructures across geographies and then co-create multiple nodes for voice so that you have plural reg registers for change. So at the end then, the theorizing for Global South and going back to the lessons from site, the work of building communicative equality. And remember, I started with the Indian constitution and I go back to it, is one about building actively a socialist politics that looks at equal distribution of health resources, of preventive resources, of agricultural resources and development resources and equal distribution of income, education, shelter and food, at least anchoring ourselves in the conversation in terms of how could communicative spaces work toward building a socialist politics that is anchored in um, serving those at the margins of our societies. And I think that fundamentally calls for us to place as development scholars and practitioners our bodies on the line in solidarity with communities at the margins. So this is my last slide and I leave you with these questions. How can my body disrupt power? What resources do I have available in disrupting power? How can I lend my body to others in solidarity? Who can I count on? So where can I get solidarity in return? when placing my body on the line in solidarity? And how can my body on the line create infrastructures for erased voices? So, because ultimately it is about voices speaking so that they can imagine uh, democracies and build democracies and participate in processes of development. Thank you so much.
I'm done. I apologize for some reason the video is not coming on, uh, but thank you so much, sir. I do hope that by learning from the site experiment, we can share more stories of indigenous communities and expand access to communication infrastructure in rural areas. I'd like to now ask Professor Vinyasa Hegde to introduce our next speaker, Professor B.P. Sanjay. Please. You cannot start your video. What's happening? You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Yes. Yes. Got it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Moving on to the next session, we have uh, Dr. B.P. Sanjay with us. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to introduce uh, Professor B.P. Sanjay to this August gathering. Professor B.P. Sanjay studied the basics of communication and journalism in Bengaluru and obtained a PhD from Simon Fraser University, Canada. He has taught at various univers universities before joining University of Hyderabad as a professor in 1995. He was the director of Indian Institute of Mass Communication, IIMC, Delhi. He has also served as the first vice chancellor of Central University of Tamil Nadu between 2009 and 2014, and then became the pro vice chancellor of the same university from June 2016 to July 2018. Professor Sanjay is presently at the Manipal Institute of Communication, MIC, Mahe. He has over four decades of teaching and research experience in several institutions across the country, and yet he is very humble and always up for discussions with students and colleagues. His interests are in the areas of political economy of information and communication technologies, development communication, and international communications. His research association with SITE began with the Bangalore University project on site evaluation led by Professor Epen and Professor Leela Rao, who was also the founding director of MIC. Over to you, sir. Thank you, A very good afternoon to all the distinguished resource persons and also invitees and those who have joined us for this very important webinar on commemorating the birth centenary of Vikram Sarabhai. Uh, I also thank the uh, Manipal Institute of Communication uh, for uh, not only agreeing but also facilitating this important interaction. Uh, since the Ruby Year celebrations of site supported by Deku in Ahmedabad, uh, I think that this is one of the uh, probably uh, significant gatherings which takes a look at site uh, and uh, what it did, and also many of the speakers have also touched upon the implications, etc. Um, my association with site, like what Srinivas Mankote said yesterday, uh, began as a graduate student in uh, Bangalore University, 
And uh, unlike graduate students of the present, uh, even although a very liberal academic, was very particular that each one of us does a dissertation on one or various aspects of sight. Uh, Professor Epen had perhaps been awarded one of the important uh, evaluation contracts for doing an assessment of sight. And I think the Space Application Center had its own team of social scientists. The Planning Commission had its own team of social scientists. And probably at the university level, we, uh, a small team led by Dr. Leela Ram, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, decided to take up the evaluation of the site project way back in 74, 75 and 76 as well. Now, some of the basic foundation texts before we went into the field that uh, even made us study, read and present was what we call as the quadrant of communication scholars at that time. The Sham, the Rogers, the Learner, and Lucian Pi. We not only had to study this text, but go back and report to him what we were either fascinated with or perhaps not fascinated with those books. Some of these things became came in handy for us when we actually went into the field. We opened up a field office in Gulbarga and uh, all the six of us were asked to stay in the villages. And uh, we had gained some exposure when the university decided that uh, our educational tour would be to Ahmedabad. And uh, we had to spend some time at the space application center. And uh, probably, as Agarwal once had said, uh, there was a Wisconsin group of social scientists, which included Epen as well. And um, they initiated us into some basics of research, etc. Now, Mohandita talked about the uh, non white communication south. What Epen also did, uh, did was to invite scholars like Seth Hamlin and Bob White, who completely inverted the notion of what was happening at that particular time, provided part of the critique of the paradigm. Did it fall afterwards or no? Only history can tell us. And uh, when we went into the field, we at the master's graduate students, not adequately equipped as probably some of the post site scholarship is, we're fascinated that uh, we are probably creating history in studying television in a rural setting. But that romantic perception probably was not actually reflected at the ground level. 
Why? All said and done, the expensive direct reception set was a property of the government. And in India, even if you provide a bicycle for a government servant to do his or her job, he will carry the bicycle liability to his pension and thereafter till he returns the bicycle safely back to the state. Imagine a very expensive direct reception set being given to the custody, custody of a primary school teacher. And uh, there was a substantial dispute of for the paltry custodian fees that they were given. The responsibility was that they should put it up at the time of the show, safely lock it up at the end of the show, and be completely responsible for its safe custody. Now, the teacher could not go anywhere because there was morning transmission, there was evening transmission, etc., etc., as some of the planners have already stated. And uh, some days he or she would excuse more he. There was a kind of a gender issue, not necessarily deliberate, but it, it so happened. And uh, with the result, uh, some days television sets were not on. Doesn't matter. Some days they didn't function. Now, this kind of uh, uh, irregular viewing dynamics, if I can call it that, naturally agitated us because in our dailies we always thought that uh, television is there and it's on and we look around, observe, do our interviews, blah, 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 etc. But the set sometimes was not there, sometimes was not functioning. And uh, in the letters, I very immediately, I probably picked up the letter and wrote to even uh, so what do I do? There is some problem out here. And my purpose was coming to the field was to study television. And I, when I say my purpose of coming to the village was to study television was because we were so much used to the quadrant literature, media, message, information, development, transformation, etc., etc. I thought, my goodness, nothing is going to happen. Ipan was very perceptive. He wrote back and said, Sanjay, the issue is not about television, television per se. The issue is for you to try and understand the context as to how and whether communication takes place or not. You are doing good. Make the observations of the custodian, the teachers, and see whether you can generate a kind of a analysis for your master's thesis. Well, the long and short of it, did manage to do my master's dissertation and uh, uh, did not probably uh, realize that uh, it was part of the uh, very important uh, scholastic record uh, in terms of what I had done, etc. Nothing great, no, no path-breaking theory was promulgated because I was 
kind of you know not yet equipped probably to theorize uh, adequately on the theme but what happened later very interesting um we had in sat chitness and others have already talked about and uh, uh the first failure of the insat series for some reason um also kind of you know had raised a lot of uh, questions of course uh, isro has had its trials and tribulations and uh, cumulatively has been able to do a remarkable job but this kind of glitches etc affecting the communication and also chitness yesterday mentioned about uh, the intel sats interest now later we also realized that the ats satellite was given for a year and not a day more now normally parking a satellite as we think in a very simplistic manner well a big country lot of scholars had advocated what television could do for india etc uh we thought that we in the sense nine us the ordinary mortals thought what is a big deal they want television they want development it could extend but no they were very particular the contract which pramod kale yesterday mentioned it's still arrived available in the archives and now available on the net uh, it was clear that it was just for one year now i'm not rubbing in the one year part of it but what i'm trying to say is that what does a nation do when it has shown a taste of television i you and others do not understand that it is only for one year it's like uh, telling the child that uh, you have the bicycle we have borrowed it for one year and after this one year you can't ride it anymore but of course no space, space application centers uh, engineers planners etc we are work, working on a continuity plan and they did manage to kind of you know, take it forward but when, why i'm going back to this is um my interest in working on the doctoral program um was not necessarily related to sight but somehow i thought that i could work on it and uh, uh, propose a very linear missing link media development oriented proposal um and uh, once again the uh, proposal in the first round they said that uh, because my university was in uh, san fraser we had the likes of bill melody Dallas Mike and Bob Anderson who had by then critically part and parcel of understanding and critiquing as Mohandatta said the dominant literature and they were not necessarily impressed and they gave me one year to kind of go back to my proposal and during the one year based on my own reading contemporary literature etc i sent back the proposal and called it uh, satellite india's rupees 1000 crore gam had picked it up from a magazine and then articulated 
technology dimension, the society dimension, the neutrality of technology, the politics of technology, etc. in the proposal. Then Bill Melody said that, fine, this is okay for us, come along. And uh, that is how the second phase of my interest in insect particularly with a back end of uh, sight began. Now, one is the celebration of sight, which we have, uh, we are very proud of it. And uh, we have, uh, including this webinar, we have planned to commemorate that significant achievement as far as India is concerned. The second one was a bit of an introspection, a bit of a critical look back as to how and why and whether this technology came about. Now, it is not that this was not written about. Here and there, in economic and political weekly, scholars like Davan and others, VD Davan, not necessarily from the space application chairman, the Davan, the writer, had articulated some critical questions. And also, the path breaking critical analysis of communication discipline, the journal Ferment in the Field had also come out into the publication domain. So some of us at SFU had the opportunity of looking at the journal quite carefully. And a uh, few of us were impressed with Halloran with Epen, with others, asking the right question, et cetera, et cetera. So the quest for research into INSAT began with an understanding of political economy of technology. And political economy of technology was not necessarily only about communication. It was about the historical dimensions, for example, of what do communications, what does communications does? We had scholars like uh, Edric and others who long ago have written about communications as being tools of empire, colonization, etc., etc. This also came up uh, yesterday when Nishir talked about the dystopian, utopian, and the contingency perspective. Uh, very often, people who think otherwise, people who question, uh, we all live in an era of uh, labeling. Your slotted rightist, leftist happening more in our country nowadays. Uh, you have to carry a badge. I mean, you in your pocket, you, whatever you say, uh, immediately categories and slots can be huh, It doesn't matter. Now, when we talk about uh, technology, uh, whether we understand it as uh, neutral, et cetera, et cetera, which there are various theories about it, the important thing for us was, uh, for me particularly, was uh, should I now look at the institutional relations? And I posited the problem in terms of where did the technology develop and where was the technology deployed? Now, that brought me to a whole network of understandings of the 
US NASA's program. And it's slightly reluctant but proactive approach to deploy communication technologies, satellites, albeit for experimental purpose. Now, they needed a large country, definitely. And if you read the USA reports, uh, Nile uh, Sham comprehensive reports, which are available in the archives, there was a, a considerable push, a considerable push for television. Now imagine, it is also mentioned that Jawaharlal Nehru was not so inclined towards television. Uh, to many of us, the part of the thoughts lies in what we call as the Chinoy Committee, the National Planning Committee document on communications of 1938-1940 vintage, where communications per se is analyzed in terms of television, telephones, radio, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so there was an understanding that the medium itself had to be pushed and advocacy was needed. Now, it might be purely academic in the present context to say that are we looking at a conspiracy, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to get into that aspect, but many scholars have pointed out that be it uh, standards of transmission, Hancock and others have the NTSC PAL and its adoption in Latin American countries, for example, had a lot to do with the politics of technology, the politics of media. We also had the Philips living behind its uh, transmitter, which they felt they could not take back. So that started partially the television in India. So the US part was that it had a mandate and it wanted to look at the technology. But there were also kind of, you know, concerns. The concerns was that there was a certain amount of apprehension about India because there was the Voice of America problem, which rocked the parliament for a few days. And uh, it was very clear that uh, there was, they were a bit reluctant. And I kind of, as part of my work, uh, looked at, for example, uh, uh, the communication between Arnold Frutkin and the space agency people, where at one point in time, um, the space administrators wanted to take it to India, but the State Department was a bit reluctant. And uh, typically they said that, no, we will not say India take it, but probably we can make India ask for it. Subtle it is, but this is available as part of the archival documents. And it happened, and the deployment dynamics, the development dynamics pushed for the ATS satellite. And uh, I mean, NASA is too big an organization to understand, uh, uh, you know, all the complexities, but it, I did, did try to make an attempt in looking at the relationship which led up to the development of uh, ATS-6. And uh, 
Then I decided that I look at the relations of deployment of technology in India. Now, this is where, you know, the very impressive, iconic, and uh, institution, ISTRO, in fact, uh, the legend lives after publication, has uh, made enormous, you know, what should I say, paid tributes to Vikram Sarabhai. And yesterday we heard Arvind Singhal talked about the minute personality aspect which shaped his concern for the society. So, you know, institutional builders like Baba, like Sarabhai are rare, but they did. They, they have built institutions. So, to Sarabhai probably uh, site uh, in the overall context was a microscope because there was there were larger interests of space technology development. But he did articulate certain positions as early as 67, 68, where he wrote a paper, Television for Development. And the relationship in India was such that there was turf war. Turf war, as we had also seen in the US. There was a, a slow terrestrial kind of an expansion which All India Radio Master Plan argued for, had argued for, and uh, there was the leapfrogging approach. Sarabhai, as powerful, as persuasive he is, was able to completely, completely persuade and demolish the argument for an incremental expansion or an incremental expansion of television in India. Part of that forerunning experience in hindsight is the sight experience. A lot of spin-offs were planned electronic industry, the television industry, the education sector, even now Bhatia mentioned, in fact lamented that the educational sector is not you know as dynamic as it should have been. So this this kind of you know deployment relationships including that of Doodashan, etc., etc., a part and parcel of my work. But essentially, what it did reflect was uh, technologies have dynamics of the approaches to science and technology, where it should be developed, where how it should be deployed. Etc. There is also an apprehension which, which sometimes is realistic as to whether I think in passing one of the presenters mentioned whether in time political and commercial interests will take over the development aspect. Now here, Mohandatta did talk about it. Srinivas Mulkati also mentioned yesterday. Now our development understanding probably got derailed because the development philosophy and broadcasting in India, fortunately or unfortunately, at that particular point in time, was All India Radio Durdash. Now, did we throw the baby with the water? Because the state controlled broadcasting 
meant a totally different kind of perception about its development agenda as well. Now, development that way cannot be completely neutral in terms of the governance structure and the politics thereof. So, including the struggle for uh, finding suitable slots, which Bhatia, Usha, Kiran, and others knew, there's almost a squeezing out of the space for education television. At one point in time, paper started talking about, see, the, the, the common refrain that comes in development program is um, a very active and a, a, a dominant, uh, what should I say, voice that comes. Oh my goodness, development, farmers, boring, you know, uh, and all, all these kind of, you know, descriptions uh, make the people who are not the targets of such programs feel that somehow there is a taxpayer's involvement on this program. Why can't it be used more for raising more revenue, what we call as the commercial uh, compulsions of, you know, uh, wanting to edge out development programs. Uh, and that has successfully happened uh, in the Indian uh, context uh, to some extent. So the, the work looked at some of the relationships um, where technology, development, people, personalities, beneficiaries, and the aspects of decision making. To give one example, uh, Binod and Alvin would bail me out. The evaluation report of the space sector naturally had talked about some gains and some failures. But uh, MS Gore, in the final analysis of the report, talks in a paragraph about the Planning Commission report that did say, for some reason, there's no substantial gain, blah, blah, blah. Now, you might ask me, what is a big deal? The big deal is when you premise the entire project on a national system for television, an evaluation component as we agree or as we recognize should be a part and parcel, uh, technically should be the basis. But as early as November, 1975, the government had moved, made a decision that it would go for the inside system. I have no issues with that, but I'm just trying to tell you the trajectory of decision making. And Chitnis uh, did point out in the beginning that it was not the space sector. Space sector was enthusiastic. But the government, particularly the political leadership, was looking at a medium for its nationwide reach. Mrs. Gandhi was very perceptive in understanding this power of the media. And let's say that she lost the election, etc. But that's a different matter. The analysis will come. Later, not by me, but there are many other analysis to why she lost it. But the important thing also to know is the political context in which site took place. Fortunately or unfortunately for the site experiment, it coincided with the internal emergency of the country. Now, what about what if? Can be a hypothetical question by us, but it doesn't serve the purpose because what it did was it gave a complete access on news and its control. 
and the perception of news and its control probably had an impact on development programs also because the element of trust the element of credibility probably had gone for a toss unfortunately in an academic discourse on what site could have done but that did happen not many want to talk about it not many want to acknowledge it but that is indeed one of the what should i say noticeable aspects of uh, the site experiment as one could uh, uh, call it now post insert i mean we have seen but television was not the only application the application that has taken us right into the digital india and matrix is the telecommunications application of insat now broadcasting uh, would have inevitably grown there are still other cities it's, it's not that the medium is bound to sat the, the television medium would have come it would have come limited transmission etc but telecommunications uh, what it did bring about was from a uh, what should i say almost a, a babu access only telephone to uh, the access to everybody in the country is something that uh, uh, one needs to uh, recognize and uh, this institutional relationship also has been examined partially by me but partially by other scholars as well the whole notion of uh, telecommunication etc now here i would kind of you know um, slightly reflect on uh, uh, the transmission model and other things that uh, mel kote talks about um one is the understanding that information somehow is welfare is available but the present day realities of uh, the digital society that we live in has already established that Uh, information is a resource information is a commodity and our voice and data are monetized now people who are concerned and talk about digital inclusivity etc um are a bit concern as to how is it that uh, we talk about mobile as being every man's media every person's medium and what what, what kind of economics is uh, happening there uh, we have realized that uh, you know, education etc particularly in the last one year the myth of a device in everybody's hand is considerably broken why for covid compulsions we have gone into online at all levels primary secondary and tertiary and indian family composition or composition anywhere else would have children at least at two levels if not more and they all need net they need device and the classes are on for at least 3 hours a day now could we have chucked out a technology choice or could we tweak the technology as uh, you know i'm not uh, 
you know, Mohandatta has put out a very sensitive cultural perspective. I can't match that kind of an insight that he has offered. But my question is that whether you are a promoter of technology or believer in technology, uh, whether satellite or anything else allows for that kind of a access to uh, the needy. Uh, we are, one is the marginalization debate that has come in. The other one is the access aspect that has come in. So what, what have governments done? This is the very interesting, you know, the uh, Chaudhary and others instituted the CIT, uh, UGC Countrywide Classroom, etc. Now, governments, Kerala, Andhra, Telangana, many state governments now have decided that we will go back to the site and the insect days and use television for education because television set can provide, so we slot it out, they have given slots for each section. And in many areas, uh, people uh, are depending on television now, back to square one on, uh, you know, for their education and uh, uh, learning. Now, site to digital India, One is the enthusiasm, one is the euphoria, uh, has brought about a lot of transition and transformation as well. But coming back to one of the, probably the last points that I wish to make, is that how did we as academics react and respond? Now, Recently, I've also gone back to the notion of the recurrent and the repetitive paradigms in our communication literature, which is due to be published soon. And uh, here, the academic community in India now, this is not a north, south, west, east, now, the academic community, particularly communication scholarship, is increasingly challenged, is increasingly asked to publish. Fair enough, no issues. But can scholars like, let us say, Melkote or some of our own eminent scholars who are working very actively on various kinds of literature. Is there a body that talks about A, this is this is the southern voice speaking? What theoretical frameworks, where do we draw it from? What empirical? Mind you, friends, that kind of a data question interpretation has still not changed. And this is where sight probably, at least in an introspective manner, raised some critical questions. Insight had a different set of questions and uh, single Nushe, Srinivas Mukherjee and all have published extensively. But is there a frame, is there a new way of looking at the ecosystem? And what kind of questions do the end scholars ask? Already the free and the liberal notion of media is increasingly challenged. Now this is where we come. Technology enables spread and access, 
but technology and technology company included is a subject matter of high criticism state regulation and so on. so do we have more voices as some scholars have argued yes let a billion voices speak let a hundred plus bloom but are the voices being looked at carefully we do is is there a marginalization of thought and is there a marginalized community marginalization of thought probably can be addressed marginalization of voices is a difficult proposition long ago democracy became a hallmark for promoting media of the kind whatever be the notions of democracy that we hold have or believe that seems to be uh, under uh, some kind of a cloud not only here but many other places so my take is from side learned a lot was at least in a position at my own very limited level ask some questions look for answers to that questions decision making etc etc and also learn extensively from cultural theorists from uh, uh, you know european scholarship and also from you know our neighboring countries who have done some work specific to their religion specific to their uh, culture etc so uh, friends uh, i decided i thought that i could uh, do a personal reflection in my journey and uh, some of the articulations i have made have found some spaces here and there and uh, definitely uh, this will be an opportunity for us and manipal institute of communication as uh, matia told us and also as mohan that i implied for us to chart uh, uh, meaningful trends in communication and media research we don't want to discover the wheel again but if communicating sound is important maybe we err on theory maybe we err on methods but at least we would have made an attempt to talk about our reality rather than a comparative reality that we all have done in the past thank you very much for this opportunity and i deem it an honor to be amidst scholars like all of you thank you so much um thank you sir we will now take a lunch break Our next speaker, J. S. Yadav, will begin his session at two forty-five p.m. See you soon.
Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed a nice lunch. For our next speaker, Professor Goody will now introduce Dr. J.S. Yadav. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, organizers, for uh, giving me this opportunity to introduce uh, an important guest for this uh, session, Dr. J.S. Yadav. Uh, yes, Dr. J.S. Yadav has over 35 years of experiences in designing uh, IEC strategy, preparing media action plan, developing and designing prototype of media materials for communication and media campaigns. He has worked for over 12 years as director chief executive of one of India's premier communication institute, that is Indian Institute of Mass Communication, where he also served as the professor of communication research before leading that institute. He has served uh, many ex in, as member of the many experts groups, and he has, he, were, he has also led many technical advisory groups and committees. He has conducted over 125 research studies, written reports, and published over eight books. Today, Dr. J. S. Yadav would be talking about his experiences of re-examining the site and its impl implications for post-site developments in India. Over to you, sir. Hello. Hello. I'm Arvind Bolrao. Arvind, hello. How are you? I'm fine, sir. I'm in Ahmedabad. Good, good. Nice meeting everyone, though yeah. not physically, but virtually. Nice. Should we start? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. You can start. Well, friends, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to associate with the webinar to commemorate the birth sanitary centenary of Dr. Vikram Bhai, Bhai, a visionary. I think Dr. Sarabhai has many, many achievements to his credit. And uh, I thank Dr. Padmarani for this, inviting me for this important event. It gives me a opportunity to meet at least virtually in Corona times with some of the old professional colleagues and friends. Dr. Sarabhai left an indelible mark in utilizing advances in science and technology in creating awareness among deprived rural tribal people to site. That was uniqueness. The one year site at 95-96 was the greatest historical sociological engineering experiment in a developing country like India and collaboration between India and NASA of the United States. The site is a huge landmark in human history of communication and development. Now, communication and development is a very vast subject and very complex subject. As you all know, communication is simple as well as very complex. As a matter of fact, human history is nothing but history of development of communication. Uh, human competitiveness, is humans are very competitive, uh, leads to exploring, expanding, and reaching out more and more people to influence them, to change their behavior, to change their mindsets, and leading to the 
progress and development. All this is fueled and facilitated by information and communication. The history of mankind could be looked at as a history of development of communication technologies, methods and techniques. Starting from cave paintings, stone engraving in Ahsoka's time, writing to printing, photography to moving image, film and television, were revolutionary changes in human communication history. The site was revolutionary in, in a sense that it used satellite. That's quite a latest technology. Because, and to address the common people's issue. Issues like agriculture, health, hygiene, family planning in rural tribal area. Uh, the site was important in terms of managing a huge campaign in a mission mode and training the required managers and manpowers. It was also significant from the perspective of evolving and sharpening research methods, methodology, techniques for monitoring, evaluation, and impact studies on the target audience. To this, Dr. Vinod Agarwal and Erwin Sinha and many others have made very valuable contribution to the process. Now in the post site, there are many challenges. Site has been successful, no doubt about it, and will not go into detail, but many of the speakers before me has highlighted, shared their memories, shared their impressions, shared their views on different dimensions of the site experiment. Now, there are new challenges in the post site era. Now, developments in information communication technologies leading to digitalization of messages and contents and made transmissions and access easy, quick, and less expensive. That's a kind of overall development in post site era that we are having and living into digital media. Today, common people have become both receiver and creator of media content. That's very revolutionary. That almost everyone, even the common person in the village, having a smartphone can create and receive messages easily. Like many other scientific inventions and innovations, IT revolution has also plus and minuses. Now with smartphones, availability, even in remote rural areas, access to news and information, news in quotes and information in quotes, is becoming easy and extensive, having far reaching implications the way one or we live, work and use our leisure time. Now the major challenge today is the challenge of creativity, credibility, and reliability of news and information. Now, reliability and credibility has become a major issue. Information technology revolution gave new spurts to rapid expansion and growth to media in the country. There are about 850 to 900 television channels and social media converting different covering different languages, regions, interest groups with each with such multiplicity of TV channels and social media, the credibility and reliability of news and information in the age of social media are in question. Gone are the days. when anything printed in newspaper was considered as truth and anything aired on a All India Radio was considered as gospel truth because that was coming from Akashwani. Now communication for development 
and when and for whom? That's another question. Now, accessibility has become easy. People have access. And as I said, it, what is being accessed, they are also creating, is created by common people. The question is, the reliability and credibility is there. But the second question or second challenge is, communication for development is fine, but development for whom and for what? But that's also a major issue. Now, I will draw your attention to some certain significant points. Next one is social media. It's a generic term and refers to the means of interaction among people in which they create, share, and exchange information and ideas with in virtual communities and networks. It is about conversations, community, connecting with the audience, and building relationships. Popular social media tools and platforms are blog, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp, and hashtag. Now, WhatsApp is the most common and pervasive free messaging system. Availability on smartphone. Over 340 million Indians are now said to be having access to WhatsApp making WhatsApp a battlefield for contesting ideas and vision of community, society, culture, and nations, and the world as well. Because WhatsApp has become a kind of platform or a field for contesting ideas. WhatsApp has become a major platform for political parties, ideologies, in democratic elections, through spread of unverified information, rumors, even toxic information, and serve as a conduit for fake news, so as manage perceptions and influence individuals, crowd, leading to public lynching, public behavior, and including voting behavior. President BJP recently said that keep sharing sorrows and happiness. <coughs> now, with digitalization, access to information, both receiver and receiver have become easy and extensive. Now, media penetrates has reached to even remote rural areas. The way media reflects, because now you can create message, they can with visuals, represent many realities. Today are not merely receivers, but creators of information and knowledge. This has far-reaching implication in terms of enrichment and empowerment of the human societies and culture. It has implications for education and training, journalism and mass communication. Now, real problems you might have noticed in recent times, the TV narratives and social media contents are managed through ownership, through incentives th and threats. Recent alleged charges of manipulation of TRP system is the case in point. The another challenge is the marginalized people. Sarah Bhaiji and the site drew attention to the marginalized people who were ignored for ages and centuries. The real social concern of marginalized people have now again been marginalized. People do not get their due attention mass media or social media, which was the focus of the site. Now, this is what communication reach and ex access has reached, but real issues of the common people are ignored, which was the focus or primary concern or achievement of the site. Now, to, re to bring back communication and information contents, 
2. Now to bring back communication information need to be brought central to human survival, development and growth. The real issues of health, economic well-being, employment, leisure time opportunities, entertainment of the common people need to be made focus of communication once again. Now this should be both on mass media and the social media. Communication for that need to be participatory to be successful as during the site. We need to have research evidence based strategy communication to change mindsets at different level and actually at all level. Now, it's so complex that communication has to be looked holistically, which anthropologists have been studying human beings or human societies holistically. I would say the communication as such need to be studied as holistically. It has information that is empowering. It has political, that is interest groups, that has culture, because all kinds of cultural identity and social identities, that's what defines human beings. And they process the information which they get with their cultural and social filters. And that's why in coming days, in the post-site era, the communication needs to be central and focused to all activities, all media creation, all media instruments, and all media communication. I would say it will affect also, and there's a lesson for journalism and mass communication teaching training programs and institutions that besides the old debate which was going on for since the printing press, that how much practical and since the journalism uh, the profession started, how much is to be practical and how much should be the academic inputs for different programs. It's true that skills need to be acquired for different media whether it's television, whether it's the use of telephone, or whether it's the use of visuals or films or digital. All forms and all skills need to be learned by the students of communication. But in addition to skills, I would say much broader multidisciplinary education to understand the local, that is regional, national, and the global ecosystem. In this comes history, in this comes psychology, in this comes uh, economics, in this will politics, political science, and history. So in that sense, multidisciplinary studies or education or reading has to be undertaken by students of mass communication to be really practice and ensure that mass communication and social media play the role, the central role of uh, raising the issues of common people, their concerns, whatever their concerns are in that contemporary today's world and today's times. I think this is brief I would like to introduce that. But I might add a few words that <coughs> though we were not actively involved as part of the site team, but at that time, means IMC, where I was professor, undertook studies in typical anthropological way. We selected a village in Haryana as an experiment, and we have been conducting many studies there, beginning in 1971, parliament election. Now, how that parliament election events related to that elections were raised, put across it is to the people in that village and how those villagers responded and reacted to those events or interpreted and took the decision to vote. I might give a simple example. I remember at that time, we lived there for a couple of uh, months, uh, two and a half months. We, we were there. Now how 
they interpreted the news or events coming. Well, for instance, at that time or before that 1970 elections, voting was counted boothwise. And that helped the villagers and village leaders to identify who voted for whom. And in the process, the higher caste, the dominant caste, normally didn't allow the lower caste, the rural caste, to vote, in, at least in Haryana, and maybe true in many parts of the country. So the leadership, the, Mrs. Gandhi at that time, decided that instead of counting votes boothwise, they will be assembled together, mixed up, and then counted at the bigger counting centers, so that nobody could identify which block or which part of the village or which community of the village voted for whom. Now, this information was announced and communicated as a part of the election campaign, but the village leader at that time interpreted that information to the villagers that no, it won't be done this election, it will be done for future elections. By giving an example that once a game starts, the game, the rules of the game cannot change in between. So the election has started, this time counting will be go on as it is or as it has been. Counting will be both wise. So keeping the scheduled caste of that village under fear and none of them voted gone for the voting booths or voted as they wanted them to vote. Because when they reached, they were told, go, your vote has been already polled. That is stealing or capturing or using or manipulating the elections. So I would say communication development change is very difficult. It's not easy. And as many people have said it, I think Arvin Sena also have been saying it, that is the mindset needs to be changed. And for that, you have to have communication strategy. And communication strategy will be based on research-based evidence and need to address to different people, different tasks, different messages, so that what is needed, because for some people, information is there, but the, some other factors are still not allowing them to change. Now, you have to take care how to make that change possible. Typical example is family planning. Almost everyone is aware of the fact family planning is a program. Awareness is high, but they believe also, but actual practice, attitude is also favorable maybe, but actual practice is not that high. Now this leads to questions, how to give the kind of information, kind of inputs, strategically required at that particular time for those particular moment, for those particular people. So the strategic communication perhaps is very. This applies to marketing, this applies to social research, this applies to all development program. Finally, to handle a mission like or a mission mode program further requires understanding of management techniques. So really communication in that sense is real com complex, has many dimensions, many aspects, all need to be looked at it, how they influence each other and have to be used strategically. So the development process and the dream or the vision of Sarabhai continues, that is reaching out to people, common people, especially in rural area and their concern. That is, as of today, the concern is economic viability or economic survival, and that might mean employment and work opportunity. People are now finding other problems like COVID-19, staying at home, how that affects the children and family relationship and the education of children of different age group. So there are many, many questions now. My point is that Sarabhai showed the way. It's for us now to carry the torch forward and look at it very broadly. Communication is central to all communication and development issues. 
And what we must ask question that if you use communication strategically, if the resources are limited, and if they're not used, market forces take it over, and it becomes instead of challenge or the channels of change, it becomes a channel for market profit revenues and profitability. Centers should remain, maybe we should continue to address the issues as their employment, work opportunity, and how we utilize our culture, that is leisure time. So really it's a big issue, very broad issues. We need to carry on and carry the thoughts forward. I think with this, I will end and happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. For all your Hello. Hello, sir. Is that okay? I, I'm sorted, Chris. I can expand on questions. Oh, can so you? actually, we are not taking any questions. We are not including questions. Okay. So, uh, if anyone has any questions, they can email it to us and we will forward it to you, sir. Okay. Okay. Right. Pleasure meeting. I'm listening to Professor Yadav. So long and the stalwarts who did the preliminary studies during those days. Well, it's nice meeting you. We know the other world virtually and many other people whom we interacted at that time. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was uh, your session was really enjoyable. Thank, thank you. Uh, I will now invite uh, Professor Anupa Lewis to introduce our next speaker, Professor Usha Rani Vasila Reddy. Jasalu Reddy. Jasalu Reddy. Yeah, Reddy. I don't know how much time I take. Anyway. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be introducing Professor Usha Reddy before you. Right. An exceptional right. academician who has taken to several pioneering roles in her vocation. Professor Usha Reddy has recently retired as advisory faculty at the Center for IT and Public Policy at the <coughs> Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore. As also, she has been the visiting professor at the Essen School of Communication, University of Hyderabad. To add to her retinue of achievements, she has been Professor and Director, Center for Human Development, Administrative Staff, College of India, Hyderabad, and the former Director, the Commonwealth Educational Media Center for Asia, New Delhi. Earlier to that, she was a Professor in the sphere of Communication and the Director of the Audiovisual Research Center of Smania University. With more than 40 years of experience in teaching, production and research, as well as in practice. Uh, she has invested a lot in development, communication, and technology. Professor Reddy has been involved with national and international agencies in the deployment of communication and information technologies for education and development. Moreover, she's recognized as one of the top academics and practitioners in the field of communication in India. Widely published with more than 50 international publications in books and refereed journals, she's a recipient of several international fellowships for advanced research. She has also undertaken extensive consultancies for multilateral donor agencies in India and the Asia-Pacific Asia region. These agencies include UNESCO, FAO, EU, AMIC, ESCAP, IDRC and COL. Her more recent work has involved training, research and consultancy at all levels of government and academia, the private sector and civil society, where she has been focusing on development and the prospects of gender mainstreaming. She is a specialist trainer for government officials and academics in nearly 50 countries across the Asia Pacific 
Southeast Asia and CIS regions. We welcome you, Madam. Uh, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yadav Saab, Namaskar. And I've been, hello. Hello. It's been a very long time. Yeah. Uh, I uh, begin by saying that the profile that I sent you and that you read out doesn't seem like a description of me. It's a description of somebody else. These are some of the things I have done, but uh, it somehow doesn't feel like it is me. So I begin with that. But I also begin with uh, saying to you what uh, I have heard in all these 50 odd countries I have visited over the last uh, 10 years, starting from Mongolia in the north, Azerbaijan and Armenia, in Asia, in Caucasus, Fiji on one side, Maldives, South Africa, um, all of Southeast Asia and what have you. The perennial question that I'm asked when I go there among government officials and academics is, ma'am, how did India do what India did? So first I have to deconstruct what India has done and how we have done what India has done. When I think about it, I think that what India has done is to invest, invest a tremendous amount over the last 40, 50 years in our science and technology and in our educational institutions, uh, something that is missing in some of the other countries. We have an advantage in that we have been able to access literature and other materials from uh, other countries. And because of English, I've been able to read them which uh, whether in Cambodia or in Tajikistan, they have not been able to access. And even if they have been able to access, um, they have had problems because of the language and their inability to read uh, in English. So um, I keep telling them that we invested and we invested a tremendous amount in experimentation, in team working, in collaboration. And much of this started not in the last 10 years, but it started around the time and before even the site experiment took off. I, you know, I see on this uh, list of speakers, panelists, all the wonderful people that I have worked with and that I have built close friendships uh, with. We have fought over the years, we have worked together, but over a period of time, we have also learned uh, the ropes, and we have learned how to compromise and how to provide the best of the opportunities that technology provides us to benefit, uh, in a sense, a communication. I came back to India after almost 15 years abroad in 1975. The decisions to return were many, but I have never regretted it. When I came back, site had just been launched so I did not really participate in the year-long experiment because I was recovering from what I call culture shock, reverse culture shock. Plus, it took me time to uh, reacclimatize and, in fact, unlearn what I had learned about communication and development in American universities. Many of my colleagues, whom I call at that time young, newly minted, many of them, in the late 20s and early 30s. Uh, products of uh, American universities and some products, as I see, I've been over there, of Indian institutions, um, uh, putting together their minds with enthusiasm, with commitment, with idealism, and with hope, and to take on the kind of a project about which we knew very little about what its end would be, but that we brought a whole lot of things uh, together. I say this sometimes with a little bit of sadness because I think the site experiment is both history and it's historic. 
Um, our careers, many of us, have been alongside with sight and have grown over the last 40, 45 years. Uh, so we are creatures of uh, this ecosystem. Uh, but I say with a bit of sadness that it is history because I myself have witnessed in a teaching department where a person teaching communication history did not think it fit to include sight, Kera, Jhabwa, and some of the other uh, path-breaking experiments in, uh, in their curriculum as they were teaching the students. And I came across this accidentally while I was trying to explain a certain kind of participatory theory of communication. And I used sight and the students looked at me as if I was from a different planet. So then I, when I asked the faculty member and he said, no, I didn't include it. I didn't think it was important. That made me sad. But it's history because history it is already almost 45 years old, you know, and there have been at least three generations since sight. Generations of people we have taught, we have worked with, we have handed over. So in a sense, it is history because to today's millennial population, some of whom are called digital natives, they cannot envision a time when the only thing we had was a small transistor radio, one in the house. And from there to go to an experiment which actually leapt forward and reached with a satellite-based television system right into some of the most remotest, uh, inaccessible uh, villages was something that was unheard of. And, I, and, a, and a bit of an aside, in I think it was 1985 or something, when Dr. Binod Agarwal and I were at a conference in Hawaii. And we walked into the office room and we saw people in chaos. And we asked if we could help and they asked if we could do something. We streamlined the process and finished the job in 45 minutes. And an American turned around and they said, now I understand how you people did the site experiment, which was a compliment to, to the achievement of many of my uh, colleagues. So I'm saying that when site experiments started, our uh, expertise and our knowledge was scarce. We were young. We were not sure sometimes of whether we were proceeding in the right direction. When all that was available, it was all India radio. There was nothing really, really called to Darshan. There was patches of school teleclass in Delhi, a little bit of Krishi Darshan, reaching out to uh, farmers in Haryana and Punjab. But there weren't many people who could produce uh, television programs, certainly not to, uh, you know, to be able to keep a uh, continuous turnaround of programs to mount even a one hour telecast. Um, there were very, very few institutes of uh, teaching, a few universities scattered, and I could name them, some of them on my fingers. The only one that was enlightened enough uh, to call it a Department of Communication was Bangalore University, where Professor Epunk, a very far-thinking person at that time, chose deliberately to fight and call it a Department of Communication. Usually these were departments of journalism, and what they taught about development communication was Radio Rural Forum and Our Village Chatera, which was B.G. Varghese's work um, in the early 70s. So this is where we were, and that we were able to achieve something is itself, now I move away from history, which is sad, to historic uh, in terms of magnitude and what it consequently, uh, I would say, spawned or uh, allowed to uh, uh, blossom. The seeds of this experiment, uh, in some sense to me, now I, I'm looking at it as an outsider because it was not party to site, although I was involved in many of the uh, post-site experiments, post-site experiences, whether it was the countrywide classroom, project class, the talkback experiments, the um, evaluation of Java project much later. So I was involved in all of those in different capacities. But when I say it is historic, I still see as an outsider, the seeds or the philosophy of um, 
site and whatever happened around it from a quotation from uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai at a meeting at the India International Center in uh, 1969. So let me read that quote to you first. He said, in any, and now I'm looking at something else, in any developing country, one of the prime ingredients of development is this dissemination of information. Information about new fertilizers, seeds, insecticides, cropping patterns, and so on. The process of education is basically related to an information dissemination process. Mass media are clearly the main component in the system of information transfer. Therefore, television is ideal as a medium to convey information and news to the masses of population on whom such an audiovisual medium would have a profound effect. He further added that India's goals included leapfrogging from a state of economic backwardness and social disabilities, attempting to achieve in a few decades a change which has historically taken centuries in other lands. This involves innovation at all levels. And I see some of the seeds of the philosophy behind what transpired in site and, and, and post site. So but I will not detail on, go into detail on the site experiment. My other colleagues uh, have done that over the last uh, uh, day and a half. But I think and that I should focus on some of the major transformations that made site historic. Okay? These are basically changes, and I will go through them and I'll explain. In, in uh, changing the, uh, the, the paradigm, in a sense, of development communication, changing the paradigm, the theories, the way it evolved. There were tremendous changes in teaching, in curricula, in the way in which colleges imparted knowledge to their students. There were also complete changes in the way we conducted research in the field of communication uh, in India, and there were changes in practice. So let me take each of these changes as I saw them. Now, mind you, I was trying to write this all up, and then I decided it's better just to talk. <coughs> it's uh, certainly more familiar because we talk in classrooms, right? So how did it change the paradigm? During the 50s and the 60s, based upon the experience of Western scholars, notably in a sense, we had, we had SRAM with uh, media and national development and big media, little media. And we had Rogers with his um, diffusion and adoption of innovations. Even prior to that, we had Lerner when he talked about how information flowed and uh, what, was, uh, what were the theories. Um, so much of the research that was there, much of what we knew were Lerner, Schramm, Rogers, and spin-offs from those. The thing about um, uh, Lerner's work, which was then uh, uh, de you know, destroyed by Dr. Rohan Samarajiva in the 1986 article, was that actually it was a product of uh, a political ideology of Voice of America in the early 50s. And what came out as a book was a byproduct of that. But we use that sometimes as where we begin teaching. Schramm looked at a grander way in terms of the role that media could play in national development. And he largely <coughs> worked alongside with UNESCO uh, to promote this notion that uh, a top, in a sense, a top-down, uh, clear-cut policy approach of using the media at the time uh, would be useful. This was a time of smaller experiments in Africa and elsewhere, which found it was not as simple as uh, showing videos in order to determine effect. <laughs> um, Rogers, of course, you're familiar with those studies which talked about how innovation percolates to a thrift. But common to all three of these perspectives was the fact that we assumed that the recipient, the villager, the woman, the child in the village was an unthinking sponge ready to absorb the information that we gave them. We forgot that these were resilient individuals who were absolutely capable of deciding for themselves what they wanted and what they didn't. And our distance as urban educated people from that social and real milieu was something that uh, prevented us 
from getting real, realistic and real uh, results. So this one way kind of research, sometimes largely based on surveys, had to give way. And that is what the paradigm began to look at. Once this team, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary team of researchers, uh, social researchers from uh, DECU and from other institutions in the country began spanning out with anthropologists, uh, educational psychologists, sociologists, um, communication uh, specialists, and finding out. And going deep into the villages, we began to look at communication uh, for development, development communication as a totally different uh, creature, as a totally different uh, 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 discipline. Parallelly, of course, there was work in Latin America, which we don't have access to because we don't know the language. And there was work in the Philippines with uh, a team of people at the University of Philippines, Los Banos, notably headed by the famous uh, Dr. Nora Quebral, which was looking at development communication. So what site sparked off ultimately in terms of a changing paradigm was that it gave birth to a different way of looking at things in communication and development in India. And it forged what um, Linnea Manioso in a book called Media Communication and Development talks about in a sense as the three schools. One which he talks about as how Nora Cabral and her colleagues develop a development communication in the Philippines. And by the way, today there is a college of development communication at the University of the Philippines in Los Banos, which was pioneering work in using <clears throat> the available technology for uh, development purposes in the Philippines. It could be disaster response, it could be agriculture. Um, so there was, they were working there. And in India, this team of researchers, this team of people was now publishing results from their field studies. These field studies showed that we have to look at it differently, that the knowledge has to come from the recipients, from the field, and it has to build into, it has to build into the way in which we design, uh, we design our projects or whatever. Professor Chitney spoke this morning about know your audience. Know your audience isn't about my knowing about you. It's about your telling me what you want. You know? So in that sense, the paradigm began to change and by 19, early 1980s, Western scholars also began to recognize that the models that they had uh, propagated, whether it was in India or in Indonesia or in other parts, were had to change. And the whole field was in a ferment and we looked at communication now and social change in a sense from a perspective of a theory of participation of participant communication. That is where it begins to draw this uh, strength from, that it is uh, a partnership in a sense between the providers of information and the recipients, with the recipients actually being major stakeholders in determining what it is that they want, what it is that. This paradigm change has continued to this day and to a large extent at the UNESCO chair uh, at the University of Hyderabad, where they begin to look at community radio as a community endeavor, it's manifest in that community uh, participation. You know, so that, that kind of paradigmic change took place. But there was also, as the paradigm began to change, those of us who were teaching in universities and had to um, deal with students began to realize that we could not simply teach um, the, you know, the uh, theories of uh, Lerner Schramm Rogers. Yes, they were important. They were important as building blocks, but we had to go beyond. So teaching departments, and this is where I talk about how uh, site experiment changed teaching departments. Prior to 1975, when I came back, most of the departments existing were departments of journalism focusing on print, mostly. Not even that much on radio. They were focusing on print, and whatever they did focus on was to feed the market for print journalists. By 1907, of course, other than Bangalore University, where Professor Ipan insisted on 
calling it Department of Communication. But when at Osmania University, we said, we want to make this a Department of Communication. It was confused with electronic communication and technology in engineering. And therefore, the only way that we could bring in communication was to say, it is going to be a Department of Journalism and communication. And, and bring in this element of communication into, into courses. So um, teaching changed, and soon after site, and soon after some of the other experiments, as demand also for young people understanding development and understanding communication grew, there were centers of development communication. Development communication became a, a major course as part of a, a bachelor's or master's program. We began to ask our students to focus on, on uh, you know, development issues in order to understand uh, you know, in, uh, whether it was coverage or in, other, in order to understand how people's attitudes change. So we began to look and the input then of social psychology, of the elements of attitude and behavior change, began to come in. International agencies also began to look at what they call information, education, communication, IEC, or they began to look at um, communication and behavior change, social communication and behavior change. So this was a complete paradigmic shift and the teaching marched alongside with it. So today you have a range of departments and when you begin to look at them, you see that they have entire streams that look at at uh, you know development and at communication, but you are not likely to find a department which focuses exclusively on the skills and not on the processes. When I say skills, I mean, I can teach you how to make a radio program, I can teach you how to make a, a television program, but the process is where you understand why you're doing it. And that is where we began to look at uh, how we have to teach our students the huge need in a sense for, uh, uh, I don't like to use the word manpower, for human resource in the field, for skilled people who could make programs. And as an aside, I will tell you, the Countrywide Classroom started on August 15, 1984, and Professor Chitnis and others are witness to it. We had available with us in this country only uh, six indigenously made educational programs. Now, to feed a transmission of one hour every day, that means three programs, okay, 30 days a month, or 365 days a year, when you have only six programs, you can see the kind of gap between the need and the available talent. So we learned on the job. We learned how to do things on the job. The producers learned on the job. So you have, then we began to look at departments where it wasn't, in Pune, the Department of Communication, where they're including <coughs> communication inside the curriculum in Osmania or in Bangalore or the University of Hyderabad, which set up as a Department of Communication, or many of the others in the country, focusing basically on this uh, particular aspect. So teaching also changed as, a, as an offspring, as, as uh, emanating, in a sense, out, the, out of the paradigm change that uh, Site brought about. There was also, in a sense, uh, this also had to make an impact upon the way in which we did research. Um, Large-scale survey, um, large-scale survey gives you a lot of information, very general information about a lot of people, but it doesn't give you in-depth, which is what you need in order to create programs. The other problem is carrying out large-scale uh, surveys with precision and confidence in tools and with the statistical methods that are required to ensure that your results are valid, those skills we didn't have. And we cannot do it. We also cannot do it <clears throat> because the data from which, the frame from which you draw your sample is itself faulty. So we began to look at ways in which we could make our research meaningful. Plus, and a perspective emerged. The perspective that emerged was, are we going to do basic research to build theory? 
or are we going to do applied research, research which addresses real problems that agencies and real people have. The need in this country, even today, is of applied research. And applied research, because findings in the field, then will go toward building, uh, building theory. But you cannot start with just theory and say, I will not do the applied part, because we have real problems, even today. And these have to be addressed by real myth. Now, in many departments actually, I've begun to teach then research methodology, not merely in terms of surveys and statistics. <coughs> <coughs> and content analysis. <coughs> Shouldn't talk too much. <coughs> but, in terms of qualitative methods. <coughs> and this was a contribution <coughs> of sight and of anthropology <coughs> and sociology, where you had in-depth interviews, you had focus interviews, <coughs> participation, <coughs> participatory appraisal techniques, you had participant observation. These were these were tools that were used <coughs> during the topic now. Ma'am, you can you can take your time, ma'am. It's it's okay. Yeah, yeah, but then I'll stop for my I'll lose my train of thought. <coughs> but take care of yourself. <coughs> okay. So what I'm trying to say is that the old Methods of survey research, experimental research, began, in a sense, to give way to qualitative research. There is a very interesting book published, I think it was in early, late 70s or early 80s, by um, uh, Pradeep Roy, which talks about survey research in third world countries. It's a book that not many people read now, and I think it's out of print. But the important point that is made by uh, Dr. Pradeep Roy at that time was that the nature of research when you, you know, carry it out, the nature of field experiments, the nature of surveys invariably changes when you're looking at doing research in developing countries. And he was, of course, focused largely on research in India. But some of the points that he raised was what you do in a, in a, in a control setting that is with a control group and an experimental group and you compare the results, completely changes when you go into the field and you do not control the, the variables you do not control. So the findings you get are uh, maybe unreliable. I don't know. We found, for example, we found uh, during the uh, National Talkback experiment of um, 1991, basically, that while we use control and experimental groups, um, we didn't find gains in knowledge as a result in the, in the experimental group as opposed to the control group that we had expected. We found no difference at all. So what explains these? It explain, there are many things that explain why it took, why, what happened. But the point of the, that what I'm trying to say is that the research as was envisioned earlier no longer worked. So we had to look at ethnographic studies. The problem with ethnographic studies is that they are wonderful, but they do not give you the kind of policy insights that uh, government or leaders need in order to make full, you know, policy decisions. Okay? So what works in one little hamlet in uh, Maharashtra okay, may not be the same as what works in a hamlet in uh, Tamil Nadu or in Orissa. So, we began to have this conflict between the kind of research that we were doing. Some of us were doing qualitative, some of us were doing quantitative, but that new field that um, emerged after site was what is currently called mixed methods. <laughs> Today's term for it is mixed methods. And I'm not talking about global mixed methods, I'm talking about how it emerged in India, in an Indian context. <laughs> Mixed method basically means 
you use definitely use surveys because you need large uh, amounts of data which uh, point to a direction but you also need qualitative tools such as in depth interviews or focused interviews to lend depth and meaning to the survey data so we have emerged now at a pattern of research which is in a sense a mixed methods we have also emerged at a different way in which we do research we look at research in projects or in activities as what uh, terms i know that uh, dr vinod agarwal has has used and many of us have also used as formative research as what we call process research and summative research all three of which are important formative particularly as an input uh, process has to see what changes we need to make and summative as an evaluation these concepts you know which we were not using before began to emerge after the site experiment results began getting published and books and people began looking at how the research was done and that is why i say that research also benefited from this huge uh, site experiment which in some ways what i call serendipity that it wasn't necessarily what we were looking for but it certainly uh, allowed this uh, uh, to um, take place finally i would like to look a little bit at uh, at practice when i say we look at practice i say that i mean when i set up uh, uh, when i was placed in charge of osmania's audio visual research center believe me i did not know the front end of a camera from the back that was how raw i was in terms of understanding the medium okay uh, practice meant that those of us who were working had to not only understand the language <clears throat> of communication but the language of the medium you know you can understand the language of the medium but not the communication you can understand one and not the other but we had to understand both and we were time bound what does it take to create programs which incorporate the best of communication principles the best of educational principles and yet meet a deadline and meet a production quality that is required technically okay by both uh, by durdashan for uh, telecast and culturally and educationally in terms of uh, the accuracy of um, the accuracy the reliability the expertise and the way in which the content is communicated this begins to began to bring a debate between what is most important in an educational television program is it substance or is it style a producer will tell you it's a beautifully created documentary yes but those programs that really had an effect in the country wide classroom were what we call burning the midnight oil which were very poorly produced but address a specific need that students had between january and march when they were preparing for their exams so where do you find this balance how how do you train your producer how do you, in in a in a media setting to understand the nuances of communication how do you train your researcher to understand the nuances of production so the two of them work together to actually produce good content and how do you do this when you're making a huge uh, national project whether it was project class or country wide classroom or uh, ciet school television how do you do this um, unless you completely change the way in which the practice of communication takes place not necessarily in commercial space okay but in the development space and therefore the ways in which we did things the way in which we managed uh, projects the ways in which we had trade offs <coughs> between what was to go on television and what was not the trade offs between different kinds of programs the trade offs between do you do it only in english or it's a country of many languages why can't you do a program in tamil or kannada because that's what my students want compare that with a national scenario and what we learned then was in practice that what you do in a small way doesn't necessarily work for a large audience and what you do for a large audience does not work for that small so in practice 
how do you set up centers how do you manage them how do you manage projects how do you how do you evaluate them what do you look for in them these were all things that emerged in the post uh, site uh, uh, you might say post site uh, um, uh, post site era obviously it didn't come out all of a sudden in 1976 or 1980 this is actually the product of almost um 20 30 years as i go toward the end of this presentation which is what I, what relevance does all of this have for the 21st century when we've got social media all around we are in a totally um, uh, we are in a media saturated landscape and where students think that media means social media that it does not mean television the television is something in the past meant for uh, education it's not meant for anything other than uh, you know something to watch when you have nothing to do what does it mean for today's uh, environment for today's millennials for today's research for today's practice let me suggest just a few things i will suggest first of all that um, unless uh, that, that the medium may change you may move from television to the internet that the medium changes and therefore the way in which you craft the message changes but the medium changes but not the process of communication and this is something we forget so you say okay i go on twitter i'll go on uh, you know on uh, whatsapp i uh, use whatsapp i use twitter i use facebook i use this and i will reach but please remember the same issues that plagued us in 1975 which was that the majority of the country had no access to uh, television the same issues plague us today with the internet and social media what do i mean i mean that only 12% of our rural communities have access to the internet and less than 5% have access to social media so what's the point of doing an online survey what's the point of putting something on twitter only those who are already going to be on twitter are going to see it what does this mean for uh, communication theory does this mean that policy is framed and a public opinion is framed by how many tweets there are on a particular subject or whether in a in a in an online survey that is uh, on an app on our mobile phone i say yes or no and uh, 50000 people say yes 20000 people say no that the 50000 people are right when basically the 50 and the 20 are not even a fraction okay of those with mobile phones and those with smartphones capable of downloading that app so the issues of the digital divide the issues of the haves and the have nots which is what we faced in 1974 75 continue to this day although the medium has changed okay we may be talking about internet and other media but the issues of access the issues of spread the issues of uh, divide Uh, continue you and i are fortunate to have high speed communication to be able to communicate via zoom and during this corona uh, you know virus lockdowns okay those who had were in private schools had online lessons what about those kids in government schools where their mother had a phone but it was a what we call a, fe- a dumb phone not even with the features that the geo phone has where the only thing that she has to make a phone call and to receive one and maybe text a message what about those kids so we so do we leave them out so uh, so the uh, the whole idea was of site as um, as mr bhatia said this morning was to reach the unreached okay reaching the unreached is still what is prevalent even in the age of social media so so the perspectives that enabled us to look at site and look at look at designing a project that would try to reach out to the unreached still holds relevance today even though the medium in which we are communicating changes so it is my advice basically to my colleagues who to whom i have handed over the role of teaching and research and i'm sitting back happily uh, retired in my comfortable uh, home i'm saying please do not make the mistake of thinking that what was done with site what was done with those experiments is history it's of historic significance it has tremendous value for theoretical inputs it has tremendous value for in which the way you do research 
in which the way you conduct your teaching and the way in which you actually practice uh, communication, okay? Because if we do not learn the lessons of history, we will be bound to repeat the mistakes, okay? I will end by saying that that is to me the relevance of sight. That is to me the relevance of all this 30, 40 years of post sight experience that I've had the privilege of being a part of. And that is to me the point that I would like to share with you and to beg with you to please go back to the basics. Thank you very much. Uh, taking a note out of what you said in your session, the site experiment was indeed his story and his trick. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your perspectives on how site changed teaching, research, and communication in India. To introduce our upcoming speaker, Meera K. Desai, I invite Mr. Karthike Goswami to speak about her. Uh, Ms. Meera K. Desai started her professional career as social researcher with Development and Educational Communication Unit, ISRO, Ahmedabad, in 1990 and subsequently worked in EMRC and Mahila Samakhya Gujarat prior to joining SNDT, Women's University, Mumbai, in 1997. She has formal qualifications in Commerce, Development Communication, Distance Education, Extension Education, Participatory Research, Women's Studies, and Gender. Her core areas of competence are teaching and research, content creation, curriculum design, and training and documentation. She has a number of publications to her credit, including five books, a Government of India Award for her book manuscript, and many more. Very good afternoon. I think you can all hear me, right? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Usha, ma'am, uh, so good to see you. And good so good to see you too, me in a long time. Uh, no, I, I, I am actually like speechless, to be very honest. Uh, it's kind of indeed a rare privilege to uh, be sitting here with all of you uh, and like uh, thanks to all of you to kind of. <laughs> make me what I have become and uh, to like I actually my first reaction to Padma ma'am was that uh, uh, I I don't think I'm the right person for this particular thing and then uh, uh, I kind of went back to the kind of process of uh, debating why me and uh, uh, I had kind of some level of justifications for myself actually and uh, I realized that uh, uh, as a kid, I, I was actually seven year old when uh, SITE was implemented. So that doesn't qualify me to talk about SITE, to be very, very honest. And uh, to kind of pick up from uh, what Professor Singhal yesterday talked about, uh, saying our ancestors and uh, um, the middle people and the children. So I think I fall into that children category because uh, uh, Arvind Ji is here and... Uh, uh, professor, uh, 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 like all, I think, uh, Bhatia sir and uh, SR Joshi sir and uh, Hansa Ben, Bila Ben and a whole lot of people who were at Deku when I was a kind of a young postgraduate uh, student who, who they all had taught. So um, technically, um, my, my teachers became my bosses, as I always say, and therefore I never grew up as a obedient government employee. Like I, I had that freedom to do what I want to do as a employee. And that actually kind of shaped me and my experiences. And uh, yesterday, um, Professor Contractor was talking about SPSS at IIT Chennai and uh, Actually, I was given uh, SPSS access at uh, Deco Isro, and that actually helped me uh, kind of do my own PhD analysis on SPSS uh, subsequently. And um, I want to kind of give that shout out to Professor Chitnis uh, because I remember that as a young student, uh, uh, he uh, did a session. 
a session on what do you want in life and uh, like he had this name fame uh, satisfaction and money and very very frankly speaking it didn't make much sense at that point and uh, now as a teacher when i do this with my students i realize the kind of relevance and importance of that kind of a clarity as a young uh, uh, graduate who is kind of going out in the world of work and uh, uh, obviously i am kind of probably the only specimen in the world who is a masters and phd candidate of uh, professor binod si agrawal so arvind ji is still not a masters student i was guided by agrawal sir for my masters as well as for my phd so i kind of uh, over to all of you and uh, all my teachers so uh, just to kind of uh, uh, give my gratitude and uh, uh, a sincere kind of um, uh, humble uh, sad like uh, thank to kind of all of you for kind of uh, shaping me up to be what i have kind of become today uh, and it's been a kind of 30 years uh, of professional work and uh, i look at myself as a indian scholar uh, located in a vernacular context because i studied in mother tongue uh, gujarati and uh, it's a kind of uh, i look at this event in itself is a kind of also a rare uh, um, occasion because uh, i kind of did a piece for uh, iimc on uh, north and south diversity in india itself so i found this very interesting that uh, two historical uh, spaces like because i'd been i had a privilege to be at manipal for a amic conference and it's such a wonderful uh, uh, institutions set of institutions that uh, are there and uh, i'm also a kind of a product of uh, institutions built by uh, vikram sarabhai because uh, as a kid i went to community science center uh, in ahmedabad and uh, we kind of uh, grew up with uh, those uh, um, day to day science experiments and sunday morning uh, film shows and all those kind of things which kind of built me and my siblings and lot of uh, children that grew up uh, with me at that point in time so uh, thank you everybody actually and thank you um, padma ma'am and sanjay sir for making me part of this uh, wonderful uh, experience because it's it's uh, kind of since yesterday that it's been a treat to kind of listen to so many of uh, uh, people who who are known to me otherwise and uh, uh, in in the language of professor datta this is another kind of non eraser because uh, this kind of revives the the history uh, in a kind of another uh, uh, version another context another location so uh, thank you for making me part of it uh, and uh, just to kind of uh, talk about what uh, i was asked to kind of talk about and uh, that's uh, where i kind of uh, would like to uh, share a few insights uh, based on my own experiences uh, you'll have to allow me to share my screen if you can is it uh, possible to yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah thank you So thank you uh, i intend to kind of briefly talk about institutionalizing education television uh, post site a critical perspective uh, the reason i'm saying critical is uh, to a large extent based on i think almost everything that has been spoken about uh, since yesterday uh, but i just to kind of give a context to uh, where i come from um, i am part of a public university system for about 20 plus years now i'm part of sndt women's university which is india's first women's university and first in southeast asia and uh, as a uh, as an academic into higher education space uh, directly landing up into university departments um, uh, i kind of see um, a death of public institutions to be very honest uh, in our country increasingly considering the way we are kind of uh, going um in terms of education especially in the context of site i was part of uh, ugc pg patshala in 2017 uh, thanks to um, jamia millia islamia and bispas das sir uh, because i did a kind of a paper for ma uh, uh, communication and media studies uh, on development communication and i'll share about that little while from here 
I also was a part uh, of like one way video, two way audio in Deku Isro way back in 1992. And at that time, uh, I think what we are doing right now was kind of uh, unheard of or unthought of. But uh, uh, thanks to the vision uh, of Sarabhai and what we are seeing today as a kind of a normal reality of interacting with anybody anywhere uh, with two way audio and two way video uh, was something that was a luxury at that point in time. Uh, I also briefly worked with EMRC Ahmedabad. Uh, it was called EMRC at that point in time, way back in 1991. And also, I am locating education only in the context of higher education because uh, my understanding of schools is uh, is uh, very very limited. Uh, I I don't think I need to get into these details, but just to kind of give my location. Uh, we uh, recognize that that variety of institutions exist in terms of education and there are stakeholders uh, which have their own kind of uh, playing and uh, and but uh, uh, sir was giving example of baiju doing very well and uh, that's where the kind of uh, worry for uh, what usha ma'am said and i i kind of it resonates my concern that that we are making uh, education a very very privileged location uh, with a certain kind of a class and a caste uh the the was uh, i went for a uh, peach transmitter closure visit with uh, hansa joshi and uh, we were supposed to kind of file a report about uh, what is the status of transmitter and uh, what is kind of happening and since yesterday we heard kind of all sorts, sorts of variety of stories about lots of programs and i also am a kind of a daughter of a father who did uh, uh front of the camera programming for pitch and uh, i have had amazing stories as a young child about uh, what programs could do and but yes i shared those um, stories and arvin singhal ji was were giving names of those uh, programs which i heard as a young child uh, i also was a part of this period uh, when i was at deku and that's called project in radio education for adult literacy and um, we have now we are seeing a podcast revival of podcast as a medium of communication and period actually was kind of uh, context to see with the print primers um, i also was part of tdcc training and development communication channel at uh, again at deku isro all this my um, insider experiences being part of deku isro team for about 2 year 2 years as a young master student uh, working with uh, all my teachers um actually had kind of trained me in uh, uh, insights in terms of research and production because i also was part of some of the um, deku productions uh, uh, having friends there in production teams and uh, the last thing that i did uh, i did some research assessments uh, for uh, jdcp um, as a kind of an outside uh, consultant but that was i i was still part of deku team uh, being from the kind of uh, i'm actually in a way also a product of uh, uh, the course uh, the academic program designed at uh, gujarat university called masters in development communication and i was the first batch of uh, master students who graduated in 1990 uh, um, and afterwards like i have lots of uh, juniors but uh, i i have this uh, kind of uh, a joke that that i'm the only person in my batch who is still doing development communication everybody else landed up doing all sorts of other things um, uh, but the last thing that i did with isro was a documentation for a science channel workshop um, uh, at uh, mumbai and uh, that's where uh, my understanding of education television and education has been viewed in the context of site and post site comes from uh, as an outsider i was also a student of ignu i did my masters another masters in distance education from ignu so i was a student and also eventually subsequently contributed to lot of odl material for uh, ignu mumbai university and my own university uh, my university also has this uh, pmmt uh, uh, um, teaching learning center which is like now a kind of a scheme which government of india is investing hugely into um epg patshala is another experience that i had uh, as a content content producer and also like right now we are all kind of into online teaching and learning and that in a way kind of brings me a kind of an experience of using media for education in a in a uh, uh, still a kind of a post site context 
the way I look at uh, post site ETV institutionalization is I'm using EPG Pachala as one of the examples. And uh, I was a part of it for about um, a year uh, around uh, 2017. And uh, I saw it in my own university. Uh, the way courses were developed. I also was part of one course where I kind of fortunately could uh, um, get uh, Sir uh, Agrawal Sir and Bhatia Sir to kind of do a piece. So it's there online, like for students who are interested, they can always go back and look at this uh, paper six of development communication in media and communication studies program. And uh, they did this wonderful uh, piece on uh, modern media for development communication, bringing in some of their own experiences of uh, uh, site and post site uh, you know, of using commun uh, television uh, for kind of education. Uh, what I kind of uh, see and has already been spoken about by a lot of speakers before me is uh, th there is a kind of an immense amount of uh, neoliberal pressures on enterprise of education that uh, is uh, kind of uh, prevalent globally and also locally. Uh, what I'm seeing also is education is becoming far more narrowed in terms of the purpose, scope and outcome. So uh, I don't think uh, when I studied uh, the agenda of getting a degree was to get a job. And uh, increasingly, there is this uh, immense pressure that all the accreditation institutions and everybody else is kind of talking about uh, job ready individuals. And that disturbs me, to be very honest, probably because of the kind of orientation of sites that I came from. Um, as a young scholar, um, uh, the the whole idea of uh, and what Usha I'm very very rightly and very importantly said is to look at site not as an history but a reality even kind of prevalent right now in our day to day lives and I'm seeing it every day actually uh, with the way we are kind of running this entire enterprise of education with a farce on online education. Um, uh, so I, I am extremely critical about uh, where we are going as a, as a kind of a public institutions of uh, so-called dissemination of higher education and the mandate of uh, uh, kind of uh, how, how, how we make our students just to kind of be placed for. And uh, one of the things that I continuously debate uh, in my day-to-day -day life is uh, to kind of not uh, look at uh, placement, uh, my, my university department as a placement agency, because I, I tell that to all the incoming students that, that my job is to train you and not to kind of make place you. Because uh, uh, if you are trained and you have skills and you have a kind of an uh, analysis of kind of situation, then the jobs will kind of are there and it will happen. And just to kind of expand from somebody pointed it out earlier, and I have a student right now who is working in the public world. And I was talking to her. She's a fresher. She just passed out in a pandemic, actually. And uh, she joined the public world. And she actually called up and uh, told me that, that ma'am, uh, I can see what we talked about in media ownership. And that's where I think that uh, we are still making sense to our students uh, as our teachers make sense to us. But what I'm seeing is that there is no institutional coordination that I, I think or I kind of perceive that happened at the time of site and post site, where probably the state and the production and the research and everybody else worked as a kind of a network. Uh, I also don't see much of a human resource readiness to transact across boundaries because I'm part of a university system and I see the silos where uh, um, people don't want to kind of let go on their own methodologies and don't want to kind of, uh, uh, they don't want to be ready to kind of accept that there can be other ways of doing those things. Wherein I grew up seeing, uh, especially at Deku, all sorts of people with all sorts of orientations and still kind of deciding to work together. Uh, I'm also not seeing much of a evaluation monitoring of outcomes happening. No doubt the state is kind of pushing it hard on public institutions, but I don't see that uh, happening in a transparent and open-ended manner in, in even private institutions. So if, if you're looking at, in my kind of, uh, from my context, I look at site and post-site educational scenario slightly in a, in a kind of, uh, uh, I'm not very happy about it as a person, if you want to kind of take it like that. Uh, and just to kind of expand what already has been kind of discussed at length by Usha Ma'am, what has changed and what has not changed. I personally feel, because I worked with about, uh, I worked with Maila Samakya for about five years and I was involved and I kind of created this uh, 
what we call uh, participatory uh, newsletter production with uh, semi-literate rural women. And um, uh, we ran a kind of a, a 16 issues of newsletter and it did kind of wonderful things. I did papers on that in terms of how the newsletter, which was a kind of a written medium, empowered uh, semi-literate and illiterate women in terms of their self-esteem and, and kind of variety of things happened. But I still don't see uh, fundamental issues being changed because we're still kind of there. We, we still need to discuss about uh, sustainable development goals. We still need to talk about fundamental needs of uh, food, shelter, clothing. Uh, the issues of social justice, gender justice, and human rights are more intense. Um, if it would not have been, then I don't think we would have been celebrating Priya Ramani um, verdict uh, so well, like somebody very clearly and nicely pointed out that it's really sad that instead of uh, um, talking about uh, how he sh he did not get punished, we still celebrate that she was kind of successful. So that's where our, our kind of uh, um, gender locations are still distorted. But I think uh, what Said brought in and which is very important and which was already kind of very clearly voiced about how people are audiences and they are not just masses. Uh, uh, Usha ma'am had a kind of elaborate uh, discussion about how methods of research and research in itself changed because of site. Uh, oh, there's a pedagogy in education which has kind of got impacted by site and subsequent experiments because I feel that a uh, lot of us actually, when I am kind of going in my classroom, I'm not, I would not, I don't think I would have been the same person if I would not have been part of uh, Deku Isro. So I owe it to my pedagogy for kind of going to a class and ask first about what people know and what they don't know. Uh, I actually recently uh, completed a volume and kind of dedicated it to uh, Vinod Sia Agrawal sir on uh, television, language television in India. And there is enough evidence about since 2015, uh, the regional language television channels are doing amazingly well and they are making profits and at the same time they are reaching out to people. We can still be critical about what actually they are communicating. But uh, that's kind of another thing that has kind of come back after 45 Hello. years of sight. Hello. Yes. And one more thing that I feel uh, has kind of uh, still... Uh, Yes, I can hear you. No, ma'am. Uh, please continue. Ma yeah. And the, uh, the kind of one more thing that I want uh, to kind of, uh, I I personally feel, uh, because the, the kind of methods that I'm using for what I'm talking right now are all subjective. Um, they may not be uh, a lot of policy insights, as, as uh, Usha Mahim pointed it out. And a lot of this is a kind of an author ethnography and personal observational analysis, uh, where you have been a part of those, uh, those uh, mechanisms of uh, delivery of education, if we can use that word. And, and, and education as a business, as, as uh, Professor Singhal was yesterday talking about, and uh, that kind of leaves education to be very little than a kind of a business. Uh, what I'm seeing is that there is an immense amount of uh, pressure on individuals uh, to kind of sustain rigor, um, uh, unlike sight. And that that may be my perception, but like I was, I, I'm kind of made to believe, or I've seen it myself, especially in a post site or in set uh, times, or even at least in Deku, uh, or even at, to an extent in AMRC, that that the institutional network is driven for social change, uh, and that is something that I don't see is happening much because what we're seeing with reference to education today, and especially higher education is predominantly uh, driven towards kind of mechanized delivery of uh, outcome rather than the processes, which uh, to an extent were kind of uh, important. Um, uh, it was pointed out yesterday uh, with reference to site and it was also kind of uh, the skepticism of the perception that the television will bring about a change or bring about a development um, and kind of look at education as a one-way deliverable process um, we still believe in that, I suppose, because uh, what happened with EPG Patshala and we have still those, and I also did a content analysis of Ignu Telecast, uh, and we still have this notion of a chalkboard uh, uh, delivering a person talking in front of a screen. Uh, 
um, did not change much, um, even post site in higher education. So we still have kind of uh, all sorts of videos on YouTube, uh, uh, generally and even otherwise, where people just stand up in front of a camera and kind of go on and talk about that. But we are missing out on this whole idea of uh, intersectional approaches to educational technology. And pandemic has very, very clearly uh, kind of exhibited that. And Usha Ma'am was very, very articulately talked about it, saying that how is it that, uh, uh, that, that there are kind of thousands of children. We actually, I have a student right now who is in Chhattisgarh and she is doing her master's dissertation on uh, uh, um, pandemic and uh, school education, and uh, she's looking at insights in terms of uh, what happened during uh, during lockdowns and post lockdowns with reference to children's education, uh, because uh, the preliminary findings uh, she was uh, sharing saying that the children are very upset now and they don't want to go back to the school. So this is a kind of pretty uh, scary, to be very honest, because uh, we are kind of changing this completely. Um, we are also, I personally feel, and I have kind of seen it myself uh, around uh, between kind of uh, 1995, uh, that this uh, whole uh, uh, community and uh, indigenous knowledge becoming a commodity in itself. And, and there is a kind of a neoliberal politics of knowledge production, uh, which, which is the kind of something that I feel um, was not so prevalent at the time of site because I think a lot of people, who, and, and interestingly, we had speakers who were kind of outside, geographically outside located, uh, but still kind of uh, brought in insights. But there is a kind of, uh, uh, this uh, this is still prevalent. The erasure of, um, if we can use the word, uh, subaltern voices and subaltern insights. Uh, I am a product of that. I, I see that kind of lots of time that, uh, it is not so much about what you are speaking, it's about who is speaking and that's kind of something that is still prevalent. So I don't think uh, um, that utopia that Professor Dutta talked about, uh, I, I just wish and hope that, that that can become a reality. And uh, I increasingly see uh, the reducing responsibility of a state from the entire uh, machinery of education um, and has already been shared uh, at least uh, um, Indira Gandhi or at least uh, Vikram Sarabhai or at least the uh, the state at that point in time uh, actually was kind of there in the process of reaching out to lots and lots of people who did not even had dreamt of having a TV set in their house and there was a community TV set to go to. Uh, there is a kind of a increasing amount of state power and I don't think I need to get into there because every now and then we all see kind of examples of how how um, Unlike site, all this entire epistemology of education as a structure in itself is changing. And uh, no doubt the new education policy is trying to bring back the mother tongue education. Um, and people like me kind of outgrew that by, because I'm, I'm a kind of product of a vernacular education system. Uh, but I, I realize that that I, I think it's extremely difficult to go back to kind of 1947 in 2025. So so it, it's uh, it's going to be very very interesting to look at uh, where we'll go as a uh, as an edu educational enterprise as a society. But uh, at the same time, I I am as a kind of uh, uh, a researcher who um, deals with uh, if I can use a word uh, marginalized learners in higher education system because uh, I work in a women's university space where uh, uh, I am reminded of uh, uh, the realities of 15th century and 14th century every day because I get students who come back and share the stories about the kind of discrimination that they face in 21st century India. And uh, I am still kind of a little uh, hopeful because I feel that that resilience and I think Professor Chitnis talked about it today morning that the moment we educate women, nothing can stop them. And I see that actually, because I see the students who passed out 20 years back and I see uh, the lot of them who are right now in my classrooms and uh, things are changing very, very interestingly and uh, very, very uh, complexly actually, because uh, the way they are negotiating uh, their spaces and their uh, uh, kind of uh, privileges is 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 is, uh, is something to kind of watch for because uh, I am a product of the pleasant 80s when my television was very very empowering. Uh, today the television that I have is uh, kind of 
16th century television uh, and uh, i i see i have kind of mother in law who watches that very very happily and uh, and i see kind of uh, the the kind of a future and i see the past and i feel that uh, there is a kind of uh, still a hope so uh, i would kind of uh, end there i am i am kind of little before time i assume but i think that will leave us a space to kind of talk about things that uh, we would like to talk about uh, and uh, that's uh, broadly from me and thank you so much for kind of allowing me to be here and it was wonderful meeting all of you and listening to all of you and thank you usha ma'am for setting that stage because uh, lots of things that you have talked about like i kind of feel every day and good to see you arvind ji <laughs> so back to uh, back to you we have time actually so if you wish to kind of talk about we can talk about things uh, i'll be happy to talk about yes ma'am feel free to do so and sanjay sir uh, bp sanjay sir also kind of raised this whole issue of uh, use of media for silencing of voices unlike use of media for giving voices is another thing that kind of i i it resonates with me because i feel that's another thing that is happening about uh, the entire propaganda machinery that we are seeing these days and the last being the fact checker itself becoming party to the fake news distribution so that's kind of another level that we are going uh thank you ma'am for filling us in on the scenario of post site education uh right now we will be taking a short 5 minute break before we begin the validity ceremony If you would like to interact with each other, uh, maybe participate in a conversation. Please feel free to do so. Arvind ji, आप mute पे हैं. Ah. I still remember your you doing your PhD. Hi, Usha. Yes. Hi, Meera. Nice to see you all from Manipal. Yes. Arvind, <laughs> hi. <laughs> What happened? Did you remove here? Arvind, bye. Hi. He is he, he is outside. Hi, hey, Usha. <laughs> Professor Yadav Ji, good evening, sir. How are you? Nice to see you after a long time. Yeah, I, I, I am seeing him after. Uh, yeah, in, in unmute, uh, Professor Yadav. Maybe he wants to say something. Hi, Usha. Good evening. I, I this what is this? Uh, what I call a conference of dunces as we are now. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, Usha. How are you? No, I, I'd like to add something to what you said. Uh, uh, to what I said and what you also said, Mira, that. Um, I don't know. I feel that there's sometimes a focus in current uh, research and practice on the micro level on the things that are so detailed that we're looking at the uh, we're looking at the trees, but we're not looking at the forest. Okay. Absolutely. You yes, ma'am. Uh, that concern is that I can understand it. I mean, I can understand because when a student has to do uh, <clears throat> a master's or a PhD, the sharper the focus, uh, the easier the study. but we are also doing two things one is that uh, we are specializing in such narrow areas that we're losing sight of the uh, the the broad broad field and um, and uh, in 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 doing so we're sometimes losing sight i i'm not talking about sit i'm talking about oh, yes yes <laughs> i agree ma'am yeah yeah of what exactly our uh, you know about our purpose is and um, not just as teachers and as uh, researchers and you raised also an issue about uh, are we going to create job ready people or are we going to teach process where is the trade off do you teach them the skill or do you teach them the process and in trying to teach them both 
you leave out something. You know? Yes, yes. You know? So, um, so I was just trying to uh, draw attention that we lose sight of the forest while we try to focus on the trees. You know, that was something that uh, has been troubling me because when I read, when I read thesis, they're so narrowly focused that I can't gain any like a policy input. I can't gain any suggestion beyond um, suggestions for further research. I yes. can't gain anything that is an implementable a policy direction. And as a result, government officials, when they look at our publications, put them on the shelves and say, are you a professor? This is the professors may think that uh, this is how they talk first. You know, so I don't know if you agree with that. Yes, yes. No, and then the, the gap is widening because of that. Because the, the, the practice theory gap is widening because uh, we increasingly anyway, we're not very, that's where I'm saying that people are not ready to even accept that, that there are differences, no? We're increasingly becoming silos instead of uh, kind of, because I think at least as you were saying, a lot of people work together, no? From variety of locations. That has kind of gone. Uh, we increasingly become very, very secluded. We are not integrating. So the, uh, a, the current uh, experience of online has also taken away what I call the warm body experience. It's <laughs> yes. so, so important in the process of learning. You know, and I know that there is sufficient research globally. I mean, I, I, mean, I know since I promoted technology at SEMCA for so many years, but I also know that there is no significant difference between how people react to and how they learn, whether it is in an online environment or in a face-to-face, -face, you know, so. We have those uh, kind of issues. I just thought, thought I'd throw this up. Let's yeah. People who want to learn. And you want to ask Yadav something? Uh, Albin Sinha. Yes, sir. So what I say, Usa, the students or learners who want to learn, they will learn anyway. And uh, in this pandemic situation, there is a no other alternative. To some extent, we have adjusted ourselves and it will take time. Any new technology that is introduced in the mindset takes a little time. And we are probably, we are forced to do it someday. We will say what is great about it. And it's a characteristics of any technology. When it is introduced, people will say, oh no, how can it happen? When we start doing it, oh, we can do it. And they will say, what was so great about it? That happens with any technology. No, I, re I recognize the compulsion of the present time. Uh, but I also think that uh, a lesson badly produced in an online environment hmm, is as good as no lesson at all. It depends because, I mean, this is a new thing for India, but outside they have been doing it. And you know it better because all your, uh, say, distance education mode started way back in 1990 when Professor Yaswal has written the whole book on that uh, in Cleveland. And he said there are very few people who are called experts and there are so many takers, you cannot reach to them. So you have to go through technology platform. Slowly it was happening, but all of a sudden the situation compelled us and probably we were not ready for that. That's the jerk we have. Yeah, it's not, I mean, learning has like, been compromised, but there's no way. Yeah, we have to live with it. We have to live with it. <laughs> Usha, I have ah. a question. Ah, will you? The Sanjay here. Uh -huh. Now, when you talked about the low quality what? of when you talked about the low quality of dissertations, huh? <laughs> dissertations, thesis. Huh? Are you there, Usha? Yes, yes, I'm here. Please let her in, please. When I talk about the poor quality of dissertations, I am huh. not talking about the uh, poor quality of dissertations that come out of the uh, come out of the University of Hyderabad. But by and large, I get <laughs> I get dissertations that come from many other universities. No, no, no. Some of which cannot define the problem, let alone do the research. And uh, you're caught between, uh, you know, that you you reject it and you're rejecting uh, uh, 
you're rejecting a future for a young person. So you're caught in this moral dilemma. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, there are issues that are sometimes very, very difficult uh, to resolve. But I'm saying, and uh, I'm saying there's not a uniform quality of very good dissertations. It's varying. The other point is, I think that sometimes they're far too narrow in focus, sometimes. All right. I, just, I just want to uh, comment on it because I'm not in the university system, but the way things are going wrong, the teachers are responsible for it. And I know how hard it is for us. Okay. <coughs> they say no. It's a difficult because I mean, the, the type of pressure you have, the type of, I mean, we, we also, we are not very brilliant students like Sanjay and you are there, but at least when I see the quality, quality was much better today than it is today, and the day after tomorrow, it will be still. I mean, the way it is going on, it will still work. Oh, unless we can, I mean, really think very I mean, systematically to improve the quality of people who are guiding, who are the supervisors. Who, I mean, they don't have probably time to guide. Then why did they, they accept it? Because of the system, UGC imposes on you that you should have certain number of PhDs under you. You should have X, Y, Z publication under you. Then only will we consider your merit is not recognized. The statistics or the numericals will help you better. And that's the situation. That's, I mean, it's a systems problem. Over. Hello. Hello. Namaskar, everybody. How are you? I'm fine. It's nice to see you. Welcome, Kiran. Fine. How are you? How are you? Fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you. All well? All well. Thank you. Good, good, good. Yeah, we are just kind of, you know, allowing for a bit of a interaction here. We were not able to provide that. Uh, we will be starting the program soon. Very good, Sanjay. That's but, fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Uh, have you been able to see some uh, presentations, Kiran? Unfortunately, very few. I had a problem the last two days. Uh, I did make it a point to hear Professor Chitnis this morning because okay. I haven't met him for almost two years. And, you know, as, as usual, I could see he was on top of things. Uh, not uh, not as as, you know, Articulate as he might have been, but yet very clear, cogent, and made a lot of good points. Very good points. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Kiran, I have all uh, sorry, I have always called Professor Chitnis as Pitamaha <laughs> through all those years in the countrywide classroom. I said to me he was Pitamaha because when he said something, that was that was it. That was final. But uh, we used to enjoy this banter. Yes, I listened to him this morning, and I was very very uh, pleasantly. Surprised at his clarity, his cogency, his uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, ability to simplify something. Yeah, absolutely. I saw I, Usha. I also saw Bhatia a bit and his passion for communication research. You know, very strong. Ill, I yeah, was Ill. happy at that. Yes, yes. I know. But uh, you know, friends, uh, we had to we had to work on uh, Professor Chitnis. Uh, at his age, uh, he engaged with almost two hours of telephone conversation with us and spent four and a half hours recording that. I mean, amazing. The youngster who went to interview him said that he has become a role model for him and his school and kids in Pune. That's the kind of enthusiasm uh, Chitnis had uh, for this, uh, not only for this webinar, and I've seen him speak elsewhere, but I think he has that passion for uh, you know, uh, thoughts and reflection. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge through all of you mm. the immense, uh, you know, help he provided in giving us that context for science. That, that's what we uh, thank him for. Uh, anything else? Professor so, Yadavji, would you like to have some thoughts, sir? Yes, Arvind, please go ahead. What I want to say, I mean, that type of discussion we have yesterday and today, 
I suggest that site should be re-looked re at, at least through the evaluative reports. I see uh, people are talking with a bit of information. Site in totality has to be understood. And um, when we say the site has three or four objectives, each objective has to be examined, dissected from different reports that have been um, presented, published, or even unpublished, because that gives the real picture of site. Otherwise, I mean, to me at least, it seems that many of us have not gone into all these publications in what happened. The site time, what happened happened during that Kerala uh, time, or what uh, happened during Dhabwa project. Because when we talk about uh, development communication, all these history has its own relevance also, and the basis of these learnings probably we can build up our you know, next. Uh, yeah, next uh, you know, uh, you know, Arvind. These two days of this webinar is actually an oral history. <laughs> it's an like oral history, right? isn't yeah. it? Of uh, what has been captured across these almost two days. It's an oral history from those who were uh, who were deeply involved. And that's very important to, uh, to preserve and to keep uh, because then you begin to look into what was in the, in the, in the mind of the people. And then you get that kind of a totality that Arvind is talking about. And it's still there is time, at least we can have complete, complete information taken from the people who were involved in the planning, execution, at the ground activation. Uh, we, we, are, we started losing one by one people, so, but it's still there is time. It's a little late, but not as late as we think about. We should have started some institutions, some uh, departments to take initiative, and that will be great service to development communication. Um, I think discipline. Over. Tanika, your comment. I, I, I think you're so right. But what Usha said and you said, Arvind, because you know this is oral history, as she said, and I wish there was some way of keeping it and preserving it together. I know a long time back, and Arvind, you'd be much more familiar with this. Uh, Bhatia was trying to compile and put together all the material that existed on not just site, but development communication. They, they very difficult that. to access, not in one place, nowhere there. And I think uh, just between friends, I can say that he was diff had difficulty even digging it out of his room. But no, uh, I think that's you know, some such repository would be very useful for the future. And I, you know, I, I'm not saying it is really history, history, but it's important history. And especially in the field of development communication, It'd be very nice if there were some way of getting it all together, keeping it, creating some place where it can all be documented. He tried putting it online, and I think after some frustration, he seems to have abandoned the effort. It should be taken out of day two, because recently Sanjay had a very uh, uh, frustrating experience of accessing something from day two. Sanjay tried, and I said, okay, we can try on our personal level, but it's nothing personal. Anybody from any part of the world can access that, that, clearing, fact, um, house, that clearing house we should set up. In fact, Over. Kiran, um, what we are doing through this seminar uh, at the Media Research Center here, apart from uh, archiving the oral history, as some of you have pointed out, we are also trying to annotate the important uh, research which specifically focused on site and uh, that would that should be that would be available uh, hopefully um, when we go digital in an interactive mode for researchers across the country to interrogate and ask the relevant uh, questions uh, we are working on that and i'm sure that uh, in due course you might see some action on that uh, as far as uh, accessing uh, Deku uh, Arvind, um, Indian researchers, uh, uh, this might be a message to Shikran Karnik, who had an open mind of allowing all of us. Indian researchers are finding extremely difficult. It's okay if I come from uh, you know somewhere else, I get all the kind of access. 
Indian researchers do not get the kind of response for what is publicly funded, publicly accessible documents. This, this has been a very great, severe problem for even anxious wanting to look at uh, technology or whatever was the documentation. And that is something uh, that uh, if some of you more uh, tuned into the ISRO culture could prevail upon Deku, et cetera. Of course, uh, ISRO has documented all of this on its website, the Ruby year document, everything is available. But some of the research that uh, you know, uh, some of you talked about, I think would be better available to the students and researchers. This is my request because I have personally experienced uh, some kind of a difficulty in reaching out and getting some information. Thank you. Oh, you're so right, Sanjay. And I think what you said at the beginning uh, is therefore critically important and from case. wherever and whatever source, yes. if we can put it together and put it in digital format, openly accessible to researchers in India, or indeed anywhere in the world, anybody who wants it, well, there's nothing, nothing confidential or secret about it. And this is research work. It should be available to all researchers anywhere to build on, to our study, to do whatever. And the best way for that is really to then put it online and see what can be done. I see Bhatia has just joined, and I was Bhatia was speaking of your attempts to put this online and your frustration okay. finally not yes, being able yes, to do so. Yes, yes, no, I heard that is why I quickly joined. Hey, uh, I, hi, hi, Ushari. Uh, I have in digital format all the reports of site. Very nice. When I, when I first tried to get this, even from SAC library, when I asked him, to, can you give me the reports on Society LTE, he gave me some two reports. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> no, there's nothing. Uh, the librarian didn't know anything about it. He was a new person. So finally, I gave him a list of authors. That Please look for the uh, reports by these people, mm -hmm. starting from Yashpal, Jitnesh, you know, everyone. Then I got a complete list of about 20, 29 uh, reports, which I have got digitized and I put them on a website. That's great. That's so great. that is available in a web, in a digital format. Those who have seen Mohan Datta, Mohan Datta has shown the list of I mean, all these state books, and I don't think that Indian scholars, many of them will not have that much access which Mohan has. Because he went on collecting everything. He collected everything from Dr. Agarwal. Dr. Agarwal gave it to Peng in Pengua and Pengua. Right. Then he came to Maika. He collected everything which was possible and collected from us. And he said, that's what he is using for his teaching also. Over. Yeah. So I also collected from Beno. I have most of the reports. Anyway, I think they can be put together so that we one, uh, one consolidated uh, uh, it is available at one place in a consolidated form. Friends, I think uh, we will disable the chat mode now. We are getting into the formal valedictory function. Uh, please uh, stay back and uh, we will be starting the valedictory in about just two minutes uh, while my uh, MC and the Padma get ready. Thank you. Sanjay, Sanjay, before you switch over to them, I, I, I've been chatting and I think I was audible. Just wanted to confirm if I'm speaking that I'm clearly audible. No yes, problem very, on the audio. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Very good okay. quality. Okay, good. Thank Visual you. and audio also. Yesterday, I was telling that it's a meeting of the extended site family. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Manipal Institute of Communication, I would like to thank our respected presenters, attendees, and students for being a part of this webinar. Over the course of these two days, we have not only gained valuable insights about one of India's largest communication experiments, but also understood the importance of culture, connectivity, and development in India. This course over the last two days has given us unmatched understanding about the sheer brilliance and legacy of Vikram Sadabhai and his contributions. To hear personal narratives from some of the most acclaimed minds today has been nothing but a great pleasure. We are honored to have had the opportunity to host such revered personalities, and we hope that we have provided a constructive platform for all our speakers and participants. 
I would now like to request Padma Kumar sir, professor and HOD of Corporate Communications to introduce Mr. Kiran Khanik, our chief guest for the valedictory ceremony. A very good afternoon. Mr. Kiran Karnik describes himself as a public unintellectual, a non-academic with a strong interest in public policy, strategy, and strategy. He's a columnist and author. His books include Evolution, Decoding India's Disruptive Technology, the year 2018, Crooked Minds Creating an Innovative Society, published in the year 2017, Coalition of Competitors, the story of NASCOM and the Indian IT industry, published in the year 2012. He also has a forthcoming book on India in 2030. He's widely recognized for his work in the IT sector as president NASCOM from 2001 to 2008, and has been on many key government committees, including the Scientific Advisory Council to Prime Minister and the National Innovation Council. As a CEO of Discovery India from the year 1995 to 2001, he launched Discovery Channel and Animal Planet in India and South Asia. He was founder director of Consortium for Educational Communication from the year 1991 to 95, during which he oversaw production and transmission of UGC's countrywide classroom TV programs. He began his career in the Department of Atomic Energy and spent over two decades in ISRO focusing on applications of space technology, especially for education and development, including the path-breaking Indo-US satellite instructional TV experiment site and the KEDA TV project. He has also worked in the United Nations in New York and Vienna and for UNESCO in Afghanistan. Currently, he's chairperson of Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology, Delhi, and Helpage India, and he's also involved with a number of other not-for-profit organizations in the fields of education and development. Mr. Karnik has been conferred with many awards, including the Padma Shri. It's such a privilege to have, to have you amongst us this evening for the valedictory session. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants and my greetings to everybody here. As I start, I want to first compliment Dr. Padmarani and the Manipal Institute on thinking of this at a very appropriate time, Sarabhai's centenary, and getting us all back to sight. Uh, even more on a personal note, it's been a delight to see old friends from site days. And indeed, as was just mentioned, not only the ISRO team that worked on site, but indeed the site team, which extended beyond, as Arvind just said, the site family in many ways. And I'm happy to see many of them either here now or earlier today in, in the day when part discussions were going on. So unfortunately, we are not able to get together physically, which would have been the best thing to do. But uh, I'm not so sure we'd have been then able to assemble everybody that Manipal Institute has been able to assemble for this seminar and discussion, people from around the world from thousands of kilometers away. And to me, this is, of course, an excellent example of how technology can facilitate things. Yes, it has its own constraints and its own problems, but this has certainly been a facilitator to get people together. And so many of us from around the world sitting in one common area in some sense, maybe virtually, but able to see and hear each other. Uh, so this is indeed a special pleasure. I'm also thankful to Manipal Institute for inviting me to give this valedictory talk and to share my thoughts on site. You know, Arthur Clarke called this the greatest communication experiment in history, but it's also something else. To me, it's probably the most researched communication experiment or communication project in India. There may be a few others that have been researched, but very, very few have the amount of rich research cutting across all disciplines in the whole area of social sciences as site has. And it generated a tremendous amount of literature and research, and we just talked of that informally a few minutes ago, which needs to be you know, preserved, studied, accessed, and built on, most importantly. This kind of research has unfortunately become rarer as, 
as Bhatia observed this morning. And I, as I told him, he made a passionate and very strong plea with which I couldn't agree more to put more effort, more time, and create much more by way of development communication research. We need that desperately today. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment, but so much of research in this area, not necessarily development communication, but just in communication is now related to the commercial world. And unfortunately, some uses of it without as much research, but a lot of research feeding into it from the commercial arena goes into the politics of it. And we saw that with what has been called the Cambridge Analytica scam, where a lot of data from other places was sourced, accessed, uh, privacy violated, and used for political purposes. This is going to be the trend, more and more use of data and the very powerful tools now available through artificial intelligence and machine learning and data analytics to get all this data and use it to first understand behavior, then to you know, affect behavior and possibly influence behavior. And this is not from the realm of science fiction. We already see that happening in many ways. And the leader in this has been, unfortunately, the commercial world. The world of development communication with which we've all been associated has been way behind on this. And I would say this not as a criticism, but as a statement of fact, that I don't think we're anywhere near using the powerful technologies and tools that are now available for the kind of research that needs to be done in the development space. And I would urge institutes, certainly the Manipal Institute, but all those of you connected with other such institutions to really look at this and to say, how can we use these powerful technologies for this kind of research? And I give this not by way of background of what all of you have discussed in the last two days, but also as a natural segue into sight. Because here was an example where the most advanced technology, the latest technology of space uh, communication of a satellite that was the first of its kind ever in the world, a high power satellite able to broadcast directly to comparatively simple receivers used for the most basic development purposes. What could be a better example of using high technology for a purpose and for development than that? And I think those of you who are active in the field of development communication research need to look at this as an example of how technology should be used as a tool to further the goals of development itself. But what I want to speak about today and share my thoughts on is not so much on the research. I know you spent two days on that. There are lots of experts. I'm not an expert in this area. So I want to share thoughts at a slightly different and hopefully a level which is of some importance both for the present, but particularly for the future, and relate that to Vikram Sarabhai. This is the whole area of what the site did and what, not the impact it had immediately, not the impact on those who saw the TV programs, but really on the people who were involved with implementing this project and what it did for the organization in which they were. So what is it that was left behind from site that permeated into ISRO, and how does it influence the space program? Hopefully, more broadly, policy issues related to technology and the country, but at least within ISRO. And that is what I want to touch on and spend some time on that this, this evening. You know, when I look at site, what is most striking, and this is to any observer who looks at it, is the vision that Vikram Sarabhai brought when he first learned about what new satellite technology could do. The fact that satellites were being created with more power, that they could send powerful signals around a very large part of the globe, and that could be focused on a much tighter way to provide even more powerful signals, enabling reception of TV, which was then very, very rare, into a simple reception equipment. To get some idea of what this means without getting into the technology of it, for those of you who are interested would know about it, those who are not, it may not, you know. Uh, really be of great interest to delve into it, but just take what happened. In the late 60s, in 67 or 68, we commissioned in a place called RV near Pune, a major satellite facility done by ISRO, implemented for communication ministry, which was a 97 foot dish, 97 feet in diameter, made of solid metal, 
for the purpose of communicating with satellites. That was what was needed then for linking your signal to a satellite, a 97 foot diameter dish. Solid metal had to be of certain accuracy in terms of machining and put up there. And in just a few years, in 1975, when site was launched, we were able to receive signals on a 10 foot antenna made not of solid metal, but of wire mesh and put anywhere and get not just communication as in comparatively narrow band voice, but broadband television of excellent quality. And I think this change was something which Vikram Sarabhai saw coming on the horizon and decided that here was something which we in India could use for our benefit. This is the kind of vision when new technology comes that a true visionary has. It's not just chasing the technology for its own sake. It's not trying to do what somebody else did a few years ago. It's not keeping up with the Joneses or doing it for prestige, but doing it in a way where you see how this can be used for our benefit in our country for the problems that the country faces. And clearly, many of you today are from my generation. There's some younger, there are students. And I want to remind particularly the students and those of us who are older and may have forgotten now that the biggest problem then was really related to agriculture and food production. We were importing food. Our foreign exchange reserves were scarce. We were getting it on a grant basis from the US, something called PL 480, Public Law 480 from the US. And the common joke was a very, very a, a phrase that you know hurts you even today, that India is living ship to mouth. That is the shipments of food coming in from abroad, from the ship, and then going on to feed people. So we were a true basket case. And how could you solve this problem was what troubled somebody like Vikram Sarabhai, who was interested in cosmic rays and research earlier, and then in space technology and seeing what research could be done there. But his mind was working way, way beyond that. And he foresaw that, look, if you want to do something here, we've got to reach out to the parts of India where there are farmers in the rural areas and reach out to them with a message and information which they can understand. Given the literacy levels then, using print was out of question. Using radio is possible, but it's not as powerful. It can't show a picture, can't show things as you want to. So he felt television was the way to go. Let me step back here for a moment. And I wanted to start actually with that, that, you know, Krishi Darshan is something that young people today would not have heard of. It was a program for farmers broadcast from the only TV station that existed in the mid 1960s in Delhi. This program came about because of an initiative by ISRO. And you, many of you may wonder what on earth was ISRO doing in agricultural programs on television, which had no connection whatsoever with space and no connection with anything that ISRO did in those days. And the reason is very simple, that quite apart from his vision, Dr. Sarabhai had firm belief in the method of science. And the method of science, as we know, is that if you have a thought, an idea, a theory, you first test it, you validate it, you have an hypothesis, you collect evidence, you test it, and then validate it, and then say it's true or correct. And so he saw that linking his vision of seeing this powerful satellite and the need for a medium, like an audiovisual medium, to convey the latest farming techniques to farmers all over. Great idea, great vision. His relationship with the top echelons of government was such that he might well have gone and sold this to them and say, look, we need to do this for the country. And let's go ahead. And it would have been a bit difficult in those days to get the investment required. Hundreds of crores to create an operational satellite, get it launched and get something going. But he might well have succeeded because he's extremely respected, very well thought of. And as I said earlier, had connections with people in government on the basis of respect. And he had obviously, as head of the Department of Atomic Energy then, and then of ISRO, a direct connection to the prime minister. But he chose not to do that. He chose to go step by step in the method of what you would call the method of science or the scientific temper, as Nehru used to say. 
and say, let me first validate the thought that television is useful for farmers. How do you do that? He said, the only TV station in the country is in Delhi. So let's put together some agricultural programs and do a proper test of seeing, does this benefit the farmers? He was convinced it would, but that is not enough. Conviction is not science. Conviction is dogma. It's something we see a lot of today. He chose the method of science, which is to test and prove. So farmers' programs are broadcast in what I said earlier was called Krishi Darshan. An independent evaluation was done, not by ISRO, but by NCRT. So a third party evaluation checking it out. And you know, I do hope those reports of those are somewhere in Bhatia's archive or somewhere else, the early reports of NCRT on Krishi Darshan. And those established very, very clearly that the farmers not only became aware of new techniques, that not only did they begin to understand them, but many of them adopted them. Of course, in this, I want to emphasize something else, which is important when we talk of technology. The implementation of this was not just on the basis of seeing it on TV, but from on the ground work on some demonstration farms. So importantly, communication is important, but you also need ground level mobilization or activity to do things. And we might come to this later in terms of how you look at communication and behavior change. Fortuitously, at that very same time, when this was being thought of, conceived, and put into place, the Green Red Revolution, as it is now called, was beginning to take off. And Dr. Swaminathan at the Indian Agricultural Research Institute was doing some great work. So we teamed up with the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, brought in Dr. Swaminathan to bring in the latest techniques of agriculture. We teamed up with Delhi administration to get TV sets because the idea was to test this on the basis of a public platform. So for the first time, we got in sets which were put as community sets in the panchayat ghars in villages around Delhi. We chose 80 villages, put the sets there, did a before and after, got some feedback, did a thorough evaluation, and established what seemed to be obvious, what Vikram Sarabhai was convinced about, but which needed scientific validation that television can impact not just awareness, but possibly behavior and practice. That was fine in terms of establishing television. The next step, obviously, again, in the method of science is to say this is fine for reaching villages around Delhi, but this is only a TV station. If we want to change India, you have to prove that this works into not some advanced area like Delhi, but can you go out into the remote parts of the country and show it works? Because if you wanted to make a change, then clearly you had to go across India, not just in a few places, but across all of India, and to villages and villagers who were far cut off and maybe not as linked to an urban area as Delhi villagers may have been in the late 60s. So the next step was also to prove technology. And that is how sight came about. The thought, and again, a fortuitous coincidence of circumstances, here was this technology which NASA had developed. And frankly, they were developing it, on the, developing it because just of technological need. It was just the next thing to do. They didn't know what to do with it. So they created this very powerful satellite, which was one of its kind, very, very new. There was some vague feeling that defense may have some uses for it, but they had no other great use for it. They weren't sure what to do with it. They kept it for a year over the US. I might remind those of you who were there in those days and really didn't know how to use it. They did a few things here and there, nothing of substance. Meantime, Vikram Sarabhai had seen this opportunity and early on, as early as 1969, signed an agreement with NASA to use this satellite for an experiment in India and he persuaded NASA not only to give us the satellite for a year, but to actually move it. Because remember, this satellite was positioned over the US to try and do some experiments there. They were very vague about how it might be used, but they had it there. So he got them to move the satellite and got them to agree to let us use it for a year. And that one year of sight, on which you have heard a lot over the last two days, I don't have to speak about that, established the fact that you could use satellite technology that you could install TV sets in remote villages, that you could put these TV sets in villages in places like Bihar and Orissa. You could run them where there was no power, as we did in Orissa, where a number of TV sets were run from automobile batteries because there was no mains power at all. And that you could then run this whole system of maintaining, keeping these sets going, 
of installing the direct reception system and before that of developing it and also make the television programs that would serve not just the farmers, but the fact that you were reaching there expanded the range of the project to saying, can we also do education for primary school children? And then got expanded into other areas of development, including health. The core of it, as I said, the starting point for agriculture, it moved into broader development areas and very importantly into programs for young school children. At a later point, the opportunity was suggested and then came up for using the same infrastructure for a teaching program for teachers. Because many people said that to get to young people is great, to take them programs that enthuse and fire them up and teach them things is great. But what we need is teachers who are better trained. So your large teacher training program was organized with NCRT. And again, you might have heard of that over the last two days. So that was what was important to me as a learning from this of what we went through the process. And I think that process is very important. That process by which you may have a thought, but you need to prove it. You may have an idea, but you need to experiment and get hard data on it, that you've got to collect evidence to show that it works. And that was also, let me remind all of us, that was also the very starting point of the large, large, very large evaluation effort for site itself. First, within ISRO, where a large team of social scientists was built up, led by Binod Agarwal. Separately, a lot of outside experts were brought in, partly to advise what ISRO was doing, but also as independent researchers. People from around the world, and in today's context, I want to remind us of this, people from around the world came, not only out of interest to study site, but out of our openness to share what we were doing and say, sure, come here, look at our research, collect the data, Go back and do your own work and share that with us so we can build on it. So we had people, some of whom spoke today, I saw their names listed, uh, Arvind Singhal, Professor Contractor, and Ev Rogers. We earlier had Bill Bashram. These were the eminent, the eminence greasers, you may say, of communication in those days. And they came here. They were fascinated by sight. But let's not forget that we had an open door for them to come in, do the research here, collect data, work with us, some programs jointly and some projects, some on their own. And they all went back and did great work. Any number of PhD students I know from the US came here at that time and collected data for their doctoral theses. Subsequently, of course, many more have to. So apart from the whole process of scientific establishment of fact and getting things done, there was also this very open policy with regard to research and with regard to data. We discussed that a few minutes ago and bemoaned the fact that it's so difficult to access some of the reports now, partly because they're old, partly because nobody's kept them properly, but also in part, frankly, because there's hesitation to part with what you have. And this is a very antithesis of research in academia, where you share and each one builds on the work and research of others. That is how science has grown. And I think it's important to remember that. And this, let me link it back, was part of Vikram Saraway's vision. He, in fact, welcomed people, even invited them to come and look at what we were doing and to study it. I think that's something that tells you about his style of operating. So I would think these are very critical factors which we need to look at in what we do. I want to touch on one more aspect which is very critical in terms of the thinking and vision. You know, this was not just an experiment in showing that television has an impact. It was not an experiment in showing that technology and the technology of satellite communication works, nor in showing that we can develop the equipment required to receive it and we can deploy it and make it work. It was also conceived as what today would be called inclusive development. This is signified not only by the fact that the whole experiment was built on the concept of community television accessible to everybody in the village, but also the fact, and I know this was mentioned in some discussion, that in choosing the villages, I think Professor Chitnis mentioned it this morning, in selecting the areas where we would go and put these, we selected states, including the most backward states. The criteria was backwardness of the state, and which is why I mentioned we went to places like Bihar and Orissa. But also combining this need to be inclusive and reach those who are the most disadvantaged was also the scientific understanding that we need for a good sample to say this works in India, not in this state or in this district, 
we need a wider sample. We need diversity. So as you can see from where we were, we went from the deserts of Rajasthan, which are dry most of the year, and even in the monsoon, there's very little rain, to Orissa, where, as we all know, it pours, to Bihar, where it rains so much that there are floods every year, and our maintenance teams, uh, to share something that's probably no longer needs to be confidential, had to sometimes go across into Nepal to reach the villages they had to maintain sets in, because you couldn't, there was no crossing from the Indian side into those villages. They were isolated and cut off. We also went into states like Karnataka. We went into Andhra. So there was diversity of language, diversity of climate, diversity of the kind of challenges that technology would face from unelectrified villages to slightly better villages. We also went into looking at the diversity in terms of the range of Indian you know, reactions that might be there, you might say. So from north to south, east to west. Also, recognizing that while we were reaching out and trying to get the most backward villages and the most backward districts, it would make sense to also compare these with a more advanced area, a comparative, an area in which there's comparative prosperity. Again, a rural area, but something that's there. And combined with that was a thought that we need a laboratory, which means not a field laboratory, but one which we can access very easily. And that was the start of the KEDA project. The fact that Kheda was an advanced district in that sense, in a comparative sense in India, and a wealthy district because it grew a cash crop like tobacco and was considered you know, very, very well off farming wise. In addition, there was the Amul dairy, which provided lots of income through milk collections. And so we chose again, very consciously, a range from the socioeconomic angle, ranging from the economic angle to the social angle to, as I said earlier, the terrain, the weather, and the kind of challenges you faced in them. So again, the whole experiment was based on this diversity from science, and very importantly, the concept of reaching the disadvantaged and the most disadvantaged, as I said, inclusiveness. So inclusive development was what this was aimed at. And this was the mission of the project. Let's not forget that this was done. You could have well done this by proving that satellite technology worked again in villages right around Delhi. But Vikram Sarabhai chose not to do that and we chose to go to the backward areas. I think that's a critical part, I, and I want to come back to some of this as, as we go further in discussing this. The other point I want to mention is completely different. Uh, again, I, I go back to the talk by Professor Chitnis this morning. He was asked a question, and he was dwelling on the human resource aspect. And it's amazing that you know many of us, and all the people you heard today who were from, from, from the site days in ISRO, were all in their 20s in those days. And yet each one of us was given tremendous responsibility and authority. This gave us a very unique vantage point because Vikram Sarabhai's philosophy was entrust somebody with a task and trust them. So it's trust and entrust. You took the responsibility, you were given the authority, but of course you were expected to deliver. And I think the kind of motivation that this provides, particularly to young people, is something which has been a lesson to me through all my years in the, in the later part of my career. That if you give young people something, trust them, empower them, and let them do what they need to do. They will make mistakes, not might, they will make mistakes, but they will learn, and they will be self-motivated, most importantly. So you don't have to look over their shoulder, you don't have to keep doing, saying, where are you, what have you done, is this right or wrong? They will be self-motivated to it. In addition to this, the critical part of self-motivation and human resource was that the big vision had to somehow be translated down to everybody in the organization. And this was something that Vikram Sarabhai excelled at. He was able to fire up people with this vision of what we were trying to do in an amazing way. You know, today when I go, and as many of you know, I've had a long association even with, in the last part of my work career with the tech industry. I found very often when I went to some of these tech companies and asked a young engineer, a very highly qualified engineer, uh, many of them from the best institutions in this country, some of them from the best institutions abroad, and working there, and asked them, what are you doing? Tell me what you are doing here. They would always tell me what they were doing in their little piece of work. So somebody was you know, writing a program to do something, something, to do this quicker, to do this faster, that's it. Very, very few of them, in fact, almost none barring maybe one or two percent 
ever gave me a big picture saying i am doing this and it goes into this system which will then do this for example i am doing this program which will then fit into a larger thing which will be there in the banking industry and that will make all banks to be able to access each other so that the consumer can transfer money from one to the bank one bank to another in the click of a switch many of them were in fact doing this as some of you would know a lot of the indian technology in fact not only in india around the world many banking systems run on software produced in india it's phenomenal but very few of them were able to see that big picture of what they're doing the transformation that they were creating not their fault it was somehow not communicated to them or not felt important enough and no wonder then that those who were motivated were motivated partly because of technological challenges in software in programming whatever they're doing and maybe and i don't mean this as a criticism many of them were motivated purely by the compensation they got that's fine that's their own trade offs but in isro what we were motivated by i think that's true of all of us and i've seen this right from the level of the you know grass grassroots you might see our workshop people who were doing machining for some of the equipment that was going out in the field all of them had this big vision of saying we are doing this which is part of the whole we are doing this as something that will take development and education programs to disadvantaged farmers and young children in remote villages in india and that gave you a special kind of not just pride in what you were doing but gave you a special motivation and i credit this as being part of vikram sarabhai's method of motivating people so certainly you know empowering uh, giving a great deal of responsibility but also giving the motivation and the purpose which will make sure that you stay motivated and that you do what is very necessary i i want to quickly move from that now to the present and the future and where this translates to me these are some of the core values that vikram sarabhai left when he went as you all know he passed away very early very unfortunately in the prime of what he was doing and you know it was left to others some people who were yet there some of us people like professor chitnis who continued to lead the team people who came in later like professor yashpal who had a great role to play and of course our chairman who took over later professor dhawan but to me the legacy that vikram sarabhai left behind continued for a long time the key elements of that and i touched on some of those key elements if i were to mention them again it is really inclusiveness the fact that technology is being developed to be focused in india for development of the country in an inclusive manner third to reach the most disadvantaged parts of the country and the most disadvantaged amongst the people in that part of the country fourth to build a team that will be highly motivated through a vision which is communicated to all it's a shared vision you might say which everybody is part of and i think these elements of where the program is and what it was doing has stayed with this role and you know as i have said very often it has got so deep into us over time that it has become part of isro's ethos or if you like isro's dna it is built in uh, i have not been closely associated with isro in recent years but i must share some degree of concern on that i don't think this dna has gone away because like dna which is why i use that term advisedly it stays with you it has not mutated it has not changed but sometimes i wonder you know one of the things that you are very clear about and there's a very famous quote a uh, very famous statement by vikram sarabhai which i will not quote which talks about why we are not in space for prestige but for the actual benefit of the country and sometimes i worry that some of these parts of what we are seeing today is more geared to prestige it's sometimes technology for its own sake which is never his goal his vision or his ethos yes the very latest technology the most advanced technology as i started out at the outset saying but to be used for a purpose which is very critical for the country i think that part of it is critical second when you do the technology you keep that purpose in mind and not competing with x or y third that you don't do this for prestige it is not to say that we were first here or second there or fourth there if you want to say you were first in something let us say we were first in solving the problems of poverty in india we were first in creating mass literacy which unfortunately as you know we have not done other countries can weigh that claim we can't so somewhere i fear or worry that 
we shouldn't lose this whole ethos with which not just the space program, but indeed all of technology started with. I had the good fortune of spending the first year, year and a half of my career in atomic energy, of which Vikram Sarbhai was then the chairman. And even there, the strong and powerful thrust he gave towards seeing this technology is great. We need it. What do we need it for? Our prime purpose is energy generation, power generation, which the country needs very badly. And that was, again, technology put to the purpose of serving the country. But he also thought of other things. And, you know, one of the first projects, I want to share this with you as almost a, a, a funny aside. Uh, I joined Atomic Energy and one of the first things I did was to go and learn about onions and potatoes and mangoes. Now, you might wonder what on earth, you know, was I doing, was I goofing off or not doing work on atomic energy? No, this was part of Vikram Sarabhai's vision. That radiation, which comes from radioactive material, is not just bad, so it is, but it can be used for good. The first use for good, obviously, was for cancer, where we all know that radiation is very often used. But the other use he thought of was to use it to preserve those things that rotted quickly. Onions, as you know, don't last for long. Potatoes have a problem in this sprout. Mangoes have the same problem. And he was curious to know whether we could use radiation as a means to prevent this so-called sprouting or decay. Experiments were done. It was established that it could. And my job, as I said, one of the first tasks I undertook, the first projects I did when I was in atomic energy, was to do an evaluation of this and see whether it's Knowing that it is feasible from a technological point of view, is it first and importantly, is it economically viable? Can we do something on scale? How do we do it? Where do we do it? Now, for a variety of reasons, the potatoes and onions didn't quite take off in that, but uh, many medical supplies did. And even today around the world, uh, radiation is used as a way of sterilizing some medical supplies. So that's a different story, but I think that tells you something about the man and his vision, but also tells you not so much, I don't speak so much about him as what he left behind, this ethos of using technology for a purpose. And that, I think, must continue. It's something which is critical for the country. It's something which is important for technologists. And it's important for people who really work on this, work on developing technologies, to have that focus as something that motivates them. Now, as we get into more and more advanced technologies in space, this is something which we need to ensure, that as we do new technologies and as we learn more science, yes, certainly science is an important use of what technology is used for, because you use technology to collect data which furthers science, which is good. It's good for India, it's good for all of humanity. Uh, you use you know, advanced technology for sometimes monitoring things in other planets, sometimes for monitoring pollution on Earth or the seas on Earth for predicting climate. So a whole range of them where technology coming through science is very useful and therefore science has its own use. But we need to establish that this is true science and it's useful science. Uh, to say I want to land somebody on the moon and uh, when he or she lands there, she will do some science is to me a bit far-fetched stretch. I mean, the question I would ask is, can you do it cheaper if you send a robot? Can the robot gather the same data? A robot like a rover. And just today, uh, I, I saw the NASA rover landing on Mars. That didn't see it landing, but I know it landed and saw the pictures from there. And it tells you that an automated thing maybe can get a lot of data. So I think these are questions we need to ask ourselves and we need to debate that as you want to send a human into space, is it for something very useful? Maybe it is. I don't know. It may be very useful. It may be something we want to do. But I hope it's not something we want to do because we will be the fourth, fifth, sixth nation to do so. And therefore, we can fly off flag and say this is very prestigious. I don't think that was the purpose with which we started. It's not the ethos or the DNA that Vikram Sarabhai planted and ISRO continued. I'm hoping has continued. So I'll use the present continuous tense, but I don't know. So I'm just raising the question. I want to leave it at that, but I want to make one last point which relates more directly, or two last points, I would say, which relate more directly to the core of what we are discussing over the last two days, which is more on development communication. And, but I want to, again, make two broad points. I'm not going to talk of development communication, whereas I said earlier, 
experts have spoken and all of you have discussed it. Two things. One, the tremendous importance. Again, I started with that, the use of technology and how the commercial organizations are taking this over. But behavior change. I think this is something very, very critical that we need to look at. And let me tell you this by an example. You know, when the Swachh Bharat campaign was announced to free the country of ODF, open defecation, very praiseworthy initiative for a number of reasons. Not just is it shameful, not just because it's bad that people have to go and do this sometimes out in public where there are no spaces, but also it's a major health issue, as we all know, because it is this open defecation, the, the, the fact that it pollutes our water supplies that creates a lot of problems. And as we know from data, a lot of the sickness, particularly of children in the villages, in rural areas, is because of unclean water, which comes from this. So a very, very important attempt, a very important program of Swachh Bharat. Uh, but the way it was undertaken was saying, let's build toilets. So, of course, lots of problems, as we have seen in the past. It's not the first time this was done. Been going on for decades. Toilets were either built badly, or had no water supply, or just crumbled. Nobody cared for them. I think this time, that part was much better done. It's all been done. But what they forgot is that in large parts of the country, and large segments of the population, uh, a, a, a toilet is considered unclean. It's not something you have in your house. It's something that's outside the house. This is tradition, long time in many places. In a number of other places, even outside the house is not considered all right. And when you open fields, this is something unclean and therefore it should be out there and not know anywhere near your house. Now, if you want to change this and get people to use toilets, then clearly you have to change their behavior. You have to understand the sociology of the place. You have to understand the psychology behind this. So unless you're sociologists and psychologists doing this, and not just technologists who tell you how you can design and build an excellent toilet, or how you can design a toilet that uses minimal water or no water at all, technology that can take care of all the waste material and convert it possibly into something good like fertilizer. Great things to be done. But the starting point has to be to understand what is the problem? Have you understood the people? Have you understood their psychology? And I think I hark back again to Vikram Sarabhai and Sait. Imagine a space organization having, you know, 100, 150 social scientists on their roles full time, not as people who come in, not as consultants, not as something contracted out. We were the only organization in the world, space organization, having social scientists at all. And even today, I don't know how many are left now in ISRO, we're probably the, the space organization with the maximum number of social scientists to get there. But I had to speak, as Binod may have told you, I missed his talk. We had close to 150 social scientists. Everything from anthropology and psychology and sociology to name the discipline, they were there. And they were there for just this reason that Vikram Sarabhai recognized, and this was part of what ISRO did, that technology is a great tool, but it doesn't solve problems. Solving problems is interdisciplinary, and it requires, when you're dealing with societal and social problems, it requires an understanding of society and sociology, of society and people. And therefore, you need these people who will help the technologist. In the ideal world, will guide the technologist. I want to spend a moment here telling you that this was the very seed of DECU. It came much later, much after Vikram Sarabhai, but it focused on three critical things. One, technological feasibility, and that came from the technologists. I spoke about it earlier. They looked at technology and said, you know, this can be done. This can't be done. This is possible. This is not now, maybe 10 years from now. Then we had economists, people who understood economics, and could analyze saying that if this technology is feasible, is it economically viable? This was something which was part of the critical part of what you need to do economically, not from a revenue expenditure point of view, but from an expenditure social benefit point of view. So is it socially you know, something that gives a return? And third, most importantly and uniquely, and I want to stress this, that even if it's technologically feasible and economically viable, is it socially desirable? And I think this is the crux of it. And our attempt was to try and through DECO, get to those projects, to those areas where you had in some sense an intersection of these three sets. So there's a whole bunch of things that are technologically feasible, technologically feasible. Amongst them, there's a subset that is 
economically viable. And within the intersection of these two, those that are technologically feasible and economically viable, you have a much smaller subset, which is socially desirable. Now, social desirability is a difficult thing, but I think that's what we are doing. And my own ambition, which is what they could try to do and did to some extent within ISRO, was to say not socially desirable, but what is socially possible? That can you take this technology and economic viability and mold it into something that is socially desirable? Can the social need dictate in some ways the technology? Can the sociologists, the social scientists, go back and tell the technologist, hey, this is the kind of technology we need. Can you develop it? Rather than technology coming up with something and then saying, how do you use it? Which is in some ways what we did for SIGHT. When the NASA's ATS-6 was launched, we said, here's something great. How can we best use it? And I think it was a good way to go about it because that technology came from somewhere else. But if we are investing in developing technology, shouldn't we reverse the question and say, what do we need? And therefore, what kind of technology will help us solve this? What kind of tool do we need? And the technological development should be driven by that and not by what somebody did earlier or what a technologist just wants to do. I think this is an important point of the effort involving social scientists in technology to solve problems. And I gave the down-to-earth problem of toilets as a way of where we need to do through whole behavior change. In this, I just want to one, mention one point because I mentioned earlier that I would talk about it, is clearly communication needs to be supplemented with mobilization. This is what we found, not just in sight, but more importantly and more thoroughly in KEDA, where the lab was much more in our control, that you needed some mobilization on the ground. And how to do it, you use other NGOs, other partners, people is a different story, but you need that mobilization, especially for social change issues. So if you just want to convey information, fine, communication is good. If you want to motivate people, communication may yet do it. But if you want to mobilize people for action, you need something more on the ground. Very, very difficult. I would say nearly impossible to do it through communication alone. So if you want people to get vaccinated, then yes, you can you know, inform them, you can motivate them. A large number may come, but if you want to really get everybody, including the large number of doubting Thomases, then you need to mobilize. You need something on the ground over there. So I think that's part of the story of what we, we need to look at in terms of the importance of social science and where it comes into this whole story. Uh, you know, I think, therefore, I want to end at this point by just talking of a couple of other things which to summarize where we are and what, what we might do. The learnings from site and what is left behind in ISRO. And indeed, I hope the broader technology sphere in the totality of what we do in India. It is the importance to be focused on the needs of the country, to be focused on what may foster inclusive development, not just development, not just GDP, but inclusive development. How do you reach the disadvantage so you bring about equity? And look at technologies that can be molded, that can be put into systems that can do all this. And to do that, you need to combine social scientists with technologists and see how these teams can work together to achieve these goals, which I think is what we are looking for. And to do that, we need to understand behavior. We need to understand how behavior changes, which means, again, and go back to the point we were discussing just before I started speaking in a more informal manner earlier, to Bhatia's point of the importance of research for behavior, com behavior communication, especially for development communication. And I come back to my starting point, the behavior communication research going on as I said in the commercial world, is truly phenomenal. Some of you may be familiar with it, but I do want to tell you that this is going to create massive change. And those of us who are interested in development need to pick from there, learn from there. Let's not be ashamed of going to the commercial world. We need to learn from there. But we need, very importantly, to not adopt, but adapt it for our needs in development. And if we can do that through some good research work, through understanding where we are, put it in our context of our country and our needs and our people and how they react to a particular thing, I think we may be on to something very, very new and different. So very exciting vistas ahead for development communication research. 
in fact, the whole of communication research in a broader sense. And I'm sure that, you know, institutes like the Manipal Institute and a lot of others will take this forward and create a whole cadre of people who can now get into these areas and begin to do completely new things. Uh, technology will continue to, you know, be the major things that tends to dominate. But I do hope that that technology will be in some sense, I wouldn't use the word controlled, but would be, I would say, molded and shaped and given direction by those who understand social sciences better, or those who understand the people better. Let me end there. Thank you all very much for your patience. I, I, you know, I enjoyed the few sessions I saw. I wish I could have seen all of them. Unfortunately, I was not able to. But once again, congratulations to the Manipal Institute. And uh, to all my friends on this, uh, colleagues from ISRO, uh, team site, much broader than ISRO, and the few new people who may be there, students and faculty of Manipal Institute, thank you all very much and take care. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening words on communications in India, especially on the interjections of technology, communication, and development in India. Your reminiscence of Vikram Sadabhai will truly be memorable to us. I would now like to invite Dr. Padmarani, ma'am, the director of Manipal Institute of Communication and coordinator of Manipal Media Research Center to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening. All good things have to come to an end. And this webinar has also come to its conclusion. At the concluding session, I have an important duty to perform to duly acknowledge all those people who helped in the successful conduct of the program. In the last week of December 2020, in a casual conversation with Professor Sanjay, he mentioned that it is the birth centenary year of Vikram Sarabhai in 2021. In the first week of January, one afternoon, we sat and started listing out people we could invite for talking about Sait and Sarabhai. I very, very, very vividly remember the day, 12th January in the evening, we sat and started listing people out who could talk on what, and immediately the same evening, I was able to contact Dr. Vinod Agrawal and Dr. Arvind Sinha. Their excitement about the webinar was very infectious and that provided me the opportunity and also the excitement rubbed on to me and I immediately started uh, contacting the other people. The telephone number of most of the participants were given by Dr. Agrawal and Dr. Arvind Sinha. When I contacted Pramod Kale, sir, he immediately agreed to be a part of the webinar and asked me to send him a mail. He also said, asked me why would I want to listen to somebody who is so old? And I said, I do know a little about you, not much, but I would primarily like that my students hear from you. Meera Desai later helped me to locate Meera Agi. Speakers like Mohandatta agreed for the webinar through a message on social media. So I did use technology in trying to reach out to most of you. And we've also used technology in meeting all of us. But like Sir said, with a purpose and also the circumstances are such that this is the most ideal way we could have done it. The inaugural session had the Registrar of Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Dr. Narayan Sabahit. I thank the Registrar for his support in giving us various permissions for the webinar and his active participation in the inaugural ceremony. Professor B.P. Sanjay for taking us through the detailed concept of the seminar and why we need to contextualize site in digital India. 
Pramod Kale took us back in time to 1968-69 when the government gave approval for the first satellite operations in India and the first television station was launched in Delhi. He also talked about the location of the high power and low power transmissions which led to the growth of television in India. He showed us how the six states and villages were chosen for site. Dr. Vinod Agrawal outlined how anthropological and sociological methods which were used in implementing and evaluating site, how anthropologists stayed in the field and the challenges they faced in terms of culture, dialect, and many other things. Dr. Arvind Sinha outlined the relevance of anthropological work, field work in site and its contribution to the development of the television program. Dr. Chitra Vaidishwaran, who spoke about the importance of understanding the culture of people for whom the program was made. Audience research is a prerequisite for good programming. And as a researcher, one has to keep their eyes and ears open. She gave us some of her personal experiences from Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, Bangladesh, and Manila. Dr. Srinivas Melkote started his talk by remembering Professor Epin, his teacher, and some of his friends who were involved in sight. And then he went on to discuss the various paradigms of development from the top to the bottom and then the bottom up approach. And he also discussed about the environment empowerment approach. Dr. Nushir as contractor talked about his experience in the KEDA program as an undergraduate student of IIT Madras and how he used the learning from the KEDA program in the study of network as he has moved on to study organizations where the learnings are still valid. Dr. Arvind Singhal spoke about Vikram Sarabhai as a visionary, a man who had multiple interests, multi-skilled, and that was a result of education and training that he received. He was working with two Nobel laureates and he always wanted India to be independent in space and its application. Professor E. V. Chitnis on the second day today recalled his days at the physical research laboratory and how the making of the antenna and transporting it to the various sites, how the television sets were placed in school buildings during the day and in the open in the evening. He outlined how site helped in development and literacy, which needs to be done even today. Meera B. Agi worked on children's program and site and how the programs had sociologists, educational psychologists, teachers, and each one of them learned it while they were on work. Messages on nutrition, health, and other issues affecting children were broadcast through some of these programs on children. Bhopendra Singh Bhatia highlighted how ISRO was responsible for connecting us to the rural areas where site was taking place. He spoke about how site created a lot of learning opportunities for people in all sectors of the industry and society. He also urged academic institutions to do research and redo the research which was done during site in the current circumstances. Mohandatta highlighted that how he's using the learnings of SITE in his classroom teachings and research, even though he was not involved with SITE. He highlighted that the intellectual understanding of the people in the global South has been erased by the white culture, and we need to look at things from our perspective. BP Sanjay was involved in SITE as a graduate student. Although SITE was done for the broadcast sector, the main thing was to be seen at the ground level. He was more interested in studying television programs and how it has been received. Sight led to NSET. Professor Sanjay was of the opinion that we have to study the political economy of the technology being used in order to understand the nuances of access and power. J.S. Yadav emphasized on how sight increased awareness among ruler people. It was quite revolutionary. People in rural areas became the receiver and creators of media content for the first time. Marginalized people do not get the attention they need in the media now. Sarabhai showed us the way. It's time for us to carry the 
torch forward by including marginalized sections or providing access to the marginalized sections in the media usha reddy talked about history and historicity of site she outlined how site has affected teaching and research of communication in the country the issue of divide access spread which prevailed in 1975 76 continues to plague the country reaching the unreached still holds relevant today it has tremendous value for teaching research and policy dr meera desai highlighted how the learnings of the site could not be used or could be used in higher educational institutions she highlighted that the inequality still persists in our society they need to be addressed and in course of time education has narrowed in its purpose scope and outcome the valedictory note was given by dr kiran karnik who took us from site to krishi darshan as in those days india had to acquire self sufficiency in food as Uh, he was talking about and a lot of speakers spoke about site and the krishi darshan and the farm demonstration uh my father was with the indians council of agricultural research and he was stationed in tamil nadu at that time and some of his colleagues who did not know tamil i used to go with them on their farm visits to help them translate to the farmers and little did i know that it was part of uh, the krishi darshan program i only knew that i was being taken because they would not understand the language properly especially the dialect because the language that they had learned was a very formal language which the farmers in that area would not understand and especially to demonstrate how to grow uh, sugarcane in uh, you know uh, with very uh, uh, hybrid varieties where they did not need fertilizers a lot sugarcane does not need lot of water and it could be grown very easily uh, in some parts of the country vikram uh, coming back to dr kiran karnik he also highlighted about vikram sarabhai who had a great vision as he had a team of people in his early 20s and 30s as isro giving them power and authority he also motivated his people to see the larger picture uh, the objectives that uh, vikram sarabhai had in mind was inclusiveness reach to the dis most disadvantaged build a team with a shared vision and it has stayed with isro and has become a part of isro's dna we are not in space for prestige but for a purpose which is critical for the country was something that sarabhai thought about and the ethos of using technology for a purpose which must continue even today was emphasized by dr karne behavior change is very critical and we need to have a look at it especially with the swachh bharat abhiyan we need to have sociologists psychologists and technologists to look at it site was the only space experiment in india in which we had 100 to 150 social scientists on roles at isro even today uh, isro continues to have social scientists on its role and dr karnik highlighted the need for social scientists to point out the problems that need solutions and technologists to work on it coming uh, i've in a way summed up what was briefly discussed during the last two days the most highlight for me personally for the webinar was that all the speakers also connected with each other during the webinar i felt that the webinar also served as a ground of reunion or reconnection with each other after a long gap sometimes it was nice to hear to your informal conversations and it was a great learning experience for all of us the other people i need to thank other than the speakers are my colleagues professor sanjay and manjushri who worked hard for more than a month to make this webinar run smoothly from identifying speakers to running the webinar 
the post graduate students the team of arushi benani sharad varsha nidhi and others who designed the material and provided the logistic support for the webinar the mahe it team satish kamath and his team for providing the zoom support and the internet broadband my colleagues who enthusiastically introduced the speakers and sudhir samant who helped us edit the interview of professor chitnis the master of ceremony alka mariam john and ulfa for stitching the various sessions together last but not the least i would like to thank the almighty for his blessings on us i once again thank all of you for giving us your valuable time and insights it was a great learning experience for me and my students good evening and have a wonderful weekend thank you Thank you everybody for being a part we will now end the zoom session